Very nice. Good morning. Welcome to our April commissioners meeting, Casper, Wyoming. Um, for those of you on the computer viewing, if you're watching via Zoom, you need to send in an advanced comment. If you haven't, you still can. <clears throat> you need to send a chat to the host with your name and agenda item on it. If you are listening on the phone, you can send an email to wgfvideo at yo.gov. I anticipate a lot of blue sheets for this meeting. I encourage public participation. First thing I'd like to do this morning is rise and do the Pledge of Allegiance off my right shoulder, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have new microphones, commissioners. So if you're in side chatter, please don't forget to turn your, your microphone off. Contrary to our old microphones, the red is good now. That means you're hot. So I don't want us on the Casper Star. Commissioner Bell caught on a hot mic. You know, that's not front page attention we need. The first item for your consideration this morning is the minutes, the March 9th. 10th meeting. Having received those minutes, what's the pleasure of the commission? Mr. President, I move we approve uh, March commission meeting minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. Is there a second? Second, second by Commissioner Jolovich. Is there any discussion, addition, corrections to those minutes? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, I have some comments yes, sir. and proposed amendments. Okay. Um, if it uh, pleases the chair and uh, uh, the commissioners who made the motion in the second, um, I'll just give them to you uh, all together. Um, I don't think they are particularly substantive. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, draft minutes. Um, on the first page, it notes that uh, Commissioner Ladwig moved to go into open session and Commissioner Jolovich seconded. Um, we were coming out of executive session and I didn't see a motion reflected in the minutes to do that, to go into executive session. And I know one was made and it was made for, uh, I believe, land and legal purposes. Um, so I think that that would be an appropriate addition. Okay. So we need to include the motion that we went into executive session, correct? That's my uh, proposed amendment, sir. Okay. Um, the second one is there's a, a few places in the minutes where um, commissioner is not capitalized in a few places where it is. Um, that's a typographical error where I think it just needs to be, uh, you know, find and replace kind of a straightforward thing. Okay. Consistency for commission. Any other additions, corrections? I believe that's all I had. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, make the comments. At least it proves I read the minutes, sir. You did very well. I'll take those as a motion to amend. Is there a second for those amendments? Second. Second by Commissioner Ladwig. Uh, any discussion on the amendments? All those in favor of the amended motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Now we're to the March. Ninth, 10th minutes as amended. Is there any further discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve as amended say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Good morning, Director Nesvik. Good morning, Ms. If you're ready, we are ready for your report, sir. All right. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the commission. 
put that up there. It sounds like it's pretty loud. I don't it's want to get the loud, feedback Mike. thing. So um, as many of you have um, discussed with, uh, with me and, and members of our staff um, here over this last couple of hours, we've had uh, plenty going on here over this uh, since the last commission meeting. I did want to start by introducing our new um, executive assistant in the director's office, the replacement for Sherry. We have Miss Tony Bell sitting right over here. And just so there's no confusion, um, she is not related to Commissioner Bell. Interesting side note, Commissioner Bell's wife is named Tony Bell. So there are two Tony Bells in the state of Wyoming, both of them in some way or shape or form associated with the Game and Fish Department, but not, not related. So um, welcome, Tony. Tony comes to us from along. She's got a, a, a lot of experience in state government. She was recently uh, the governor's scheduler and has um, extensive experience before that doing a variety of different jobs for over the last 30 years or so. So we are glad to have Tony on board. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to start um, with some discussion over um, probably the most important topic that our agency is dealing with right now, and that's dealing with uh, winter mortality, significant winter mortality, likely a winter like most of us have not ever seen, at least at this scale, um, affecting this many areas of, of Wyoming. Um, we've certainly had some times in the past when we've seen severe impacts in local, you know, in one or two herd units. Um, but, you know, right now we're looking at impacts to um, both fawn and adult um, survivability or survival in pronghorn and mule deer primarily from Bags to Rollins to Casper, west to Pinedale, Lander Riverton area, Cokeville, Kemmer, Evanston, Rock Springs, that entire portion of the state of Wyoming had at least some level of mortality in some places um, quite extreme. We know that in, in some of those places where we've got collars that we can basically uh, um, evaluate in real time what the mortality is with some reasonable predictability. We know that we've got as much as 60% um, mortality in adults in some of those herds. And we know that um, 95 plus percent of the fawns in some of those herds have, um, are, are dead. Um, significant, significant impact. So the one thing I did wanna highlight here is, is uh, the timing on the commission's approval and the wildlife division's work on doing this additional mule deer monitoring and investing, you invested uh, an additional about $2.5 2 million into uh, much more precise and intense mule deer monitoring. That, that's already paying off. We were able to watch this in real time in, our, in the herds, our focus herds, and see what was actually happening on the ground. We, when a collar would go on mortality, we could go out and, and evaluate that and know out of all those collared animals, how many of them uh, perished from the winter great information, and it's going to help us um, be able to answer questions from the public as well as you on how severe this really was. Um, we have had some elk mortality, not very much. Um, it's been localized, and, you know, typically we, we've never seen a lot of elk mortality from winter. We have seen a little bit this year, but it, not nearly the impacts as we've seen with pronghorn and uh, mule deer. We have initiated emergency feeding in several places, um, Labarge Creek all the way around the south end of the Wyoming Range, uh, Cokeville, and those emergency feeding operations were initiated um, not necessarily to prevent starvation, but to um, mitigate the potential transmission of brucellosis from elk. Cattle elk showed up in places where we typically do not see elk. Um, there was um, places where there was unprotected hay because um, those operations weren't used to having elk around their haystacks in the wintertime. And so we initiated that emergency feeding to try to mitigate that damage and also reduce um, the potential transmission of brucellosis to elk. Um, we are concerned and we are going to be monitoring um, those uh, brucellosis um, because we had elk in new places. Um, you know, there, we do have concerns that there, there could be um, transmission of brucellosis to places we haven't seen it before. Um, we did two uh, town hall meetings, one in person in Pinedale. The governor initiated these town halls. Um, myself, Dr. Monteith, and uh, the governor attended those and presented information on what we knew at the time and also took a lot of feedback from the public. The meeting in Pinedale was very well attended. Commissioner Roberts was there, as well as um, 
several of our local game and fish staff. We had our regional supervisors from uh, Jackson, Pinedale, and Green River at that town hall. And um, you know, the, the takeaway was people in that part of the world are very concerned about what they had seen. The, um, on top of the, the bad winter and mortality caused from deep snow and very cold temperatures. Um, in addition to that, we had a disease outbreak in pronghorn um, with a strain of pneumonia that we have never seen in, in pronghorn until 2019 in the Gillette area. And so, um, and that we know um, killed several antelope was, uh, was a primary cause in some of those herds of the mortality that we saw. Um, our, our veterinary folks are um, doing um, strain analysis to try to learn all that we can from this outbreak of pneumonia. And um, there'll be more to follow on that. It takes a long time to do that, about six months. But we hope to learn from what we, what we can from this, um, this disease. We also know that when you have bad winter conditions, it exacerbates the effects of diseases like pneumonia. And so um, more to follow on that. We did the other town hall. We ended up having to do it virtual because this winter just would not go away. And um, there was a lot of roads closed and we were concerned with pe people being able to get to the, the meeting. We did that virtually. Um, it was gonna be in Rollins, but uh, it ended up being online. Again, very well attended and had a lot of um, very passionate feedback from our public. So some of the key points that I think are important for, um, for all of you and the public to know is we are continually and very closely monitoring um, this situation, including the collar data, our employees' field observations when they're out on the ground, public observations that we hear from, from folks that are out on the ground, landowner feedback. And, and we have, you're gonna see tomorrow, the proposal has been modified um, recently and you will see uh, the most conservative hunting season proposals that um, we've ever recommended, at least in my 27 or 28 years with the department. Um, we do have the ability to, um, after this commission meeting, if some new information was to become available and we knew something new that, want, that, that um, indicated to us that we should make changes, we have the ability to do that after this is passed. It's certainly not a desirable situation. It's very it would be very confusing for the public, but it, it's a backstop. And, and you all should know we have the ability to do emergency regulations um, really at any time with the approval of the president of the commission and the governor. And those can be put into place for 120 days and renewed once. So up to 240 days um, that we could do emergency regulations if that was necessary. Um, you know, I think it's also important to know we've, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity that we have is really only for buck harvest in those areas that have been most affected. And, and, and buck harvest um, is not going to uh, affect the, how fast these populations recover from this winter. Um, what we tried to do is be conservative and make sure that um, the experience was real, you know, that there was enough animals there for the experience to be real. Um, and that but, but you're gonna see significant reductions even in the buck opportunity in those areas that were most affected. We will be you know, evaluating what things can be done to help um, speed the recovery. There's a lot of things that we do that, that you've all approved with the Mule Deer Initiative that are focused on the longer term. Obviously habitat work is, is very important to make sure that um, animals have abil the ability to be more resilient when we do have these difficult winters. So habitat work, we will continue to prioritize that and, and focus those in places that are the most important. Fence work, um, when you have these kind of winters, fences can be one of the biggest um, impediments to um, animals being able to use all the available resources. And if they can't move around, it makes it more difficult for them to survive these, these more difficult winters. And then certainly highway crossings. And this commission has, has been um, leaders in developing new wildlife crossings around the state. You know, we're going to look at, um, we're going to sit down and look at all. Uh, I've heard a lot of feedback about what else we can do. Um, we have in the past, when we've had, um, you know, significant mortality, we've looked at doing, working at the other side of the, the wildlife management predator prey equation. Um, we are going to, and we've done this in the past, look at um, coyote treatments. If, if, they can be effective where and when, and um, we're gonna be evaluating that. We'll also be evaluating other 
um, predators that the commission has um, has management authority over like mountain lions and black bears. The, um, I mentioned fence conversion. The other thing I would just say before I move on to some other um, thoughts here is, you know, that the, the best help we can probably all pray for and hope for is, is just mother nature. We've got a heck of a good start to this spring. Um, a lot of those species that pronghorn and mule deer rely on, um, a lot of browse species, sagebrush, bitterbrush, mountain mahogany, they do very well with early spring moisture, especially melting snow. And so we're going to have a heck of a good start to this summer. And we got a, um, a, one of the best things that could happen to more quickly recover these populations is for us to have a good, a good moisture year. You know, I, I think it's important for you all to know, some of you have witnessed it firsthand. I know Commissioner Roberts has been um, very involved, but our field manager, managers have worked extremely hard um, to handle this difficult situation. Our supervisors um, in Pinedale, um, John Lund, supervisor in Jackson, Brad Hovengay, supervisor in Green River, Todd Graham, and their, their respective teams have, um, have, have been working their tails off to deal with all of the challenges that come with these kind of difficult um, winters. And I really, my hat's off to them and I really appreciate their, their diligence and their passion for trying to do the right thing for wildlife. You know, I think it's also um, important to know that um, wildlife populations in our state have evolved um, dealing with these kind of severe winters. We know they've happened before and, um, and, and they've been dealing with these things for centuries and they do recover. Um, but certainly folks are, are very concerned when they see this kind of mortality. And I think that's a reflection of the value that the people in our state have for wildlife. And I, I mean, that's, that's great that people care so much about wildlife. I'm glad we live in a state like that. With that, I think I'm going to ask Chief King to come up and just give you a quick update on his thoughts and our plans for uh, evaluating the shed antler season that will be opening in certain parts of the state here in, on May 1st. I'll turn the mic over to him. Mr. Chair. Commissioner. Um, may I just ask two really quick follow-up questions to the director may before we move on? Um, director Desvik, I, I, I appreciate your report and um, appreciate the effort that I've seen go into trying to monitor and figure out what the best practice is going forward and participated um, in uh, conversations uh, with a lot of your supervisors. I've been lucky enough to and um, thank them for their work. They're, um, you know, just underscores to me the degree of dedication that they have trying to address a tragic situation. Um, with, um, there's that, but, um, you mentioned, a pneumonia outbreak with pronghorn. Um, where was that geographically? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President, Commissioner Masterson for that question. I, I should have mentioned that that was in the Pinedale area. Um, that was pretty much the epicenter, but we did detect, um, pneumonia down all the way to just North of Rock Springs. Do you, uh, is there any way to know at this point uh, if it's an isolated outbreak or if it will become endemic? Any idea? So, you know, if, um, I don't believe that we believe it's endemic at this point. Um, there are people that are much more smarter on disease um, than, than I am that uh, we could certainly follow up with you on that. I don't want to make too many predictions there. Right now, we, we have not detected it outside of that area between Pinedale and Rock Springs. When this happened in Gillette in 2019, you know, we did not see it widespread the next year. I'm not even sure we detected any of it the next year, but we can certainly find that out. Um, my last question um, isn't for you to answer right now, but um, down the road, uh, I would be curious, um, just for my educational purposes, I certainly won't speak for the rest of the body about what impact this winter will have um, going forward, you know, into the next year. What impacts are we going to see from it? Um, 
you know, as far as recovery and, you know, newborns and breeding and what, if any, impact that has. I'll, I'll bet you you're going to cover that. But um, educationally speaking for background, I'd, I'd like to get with you at some point. And you can point me in the right direction. Absolutely. Mr. President and Commissioner Masterson, we will be providing some um, informational presentations over this coming year about how these winters affect um, different different populations and and how all of the different variables that go into the ecology of these different herd units play into the recovery. There's a lot of work that's been done here. The commission's funded a ton of that work with with um, Hob School, the Monteith shop. Dr. Kevin Monteith is um, he, he's presented to the commission many times, and we'll have him do that again. And then we've also got experts in the in the department too, and. Amber Hall's shop that can talk to a lot of that, and we'll be glad to do that. Thank you. Uh, Director Nesvik, thank you for your leadership and your uh, caring about this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Chief King, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, President Brokaw, members of the commission. Appreciate the opportunity to give you a quick update on some of our thoughts regarding the shed antler season. So as, as Director Nesvik mentioned, our field folks have been out monitoring conditions extensively all winter long and including um, quite a few hours of flight time, especially in the last several weeks so that they can get up in the air and look at winter conditions uh, from, from the air, which is a great way to see the extent of, of conditions. Our, our folks are pretty concerned about our upcoming shed antler season. So as you all know, the current regulation prohibits the collection of shed antlers in a big chunk of the state uh, through 6 a.m. on May 1st. And as we are two weeks out from that right now, I have a, a current assessment of conditions that we have across the state and, and then a recommendation for, for you all to consider as we, as we think about the winter conditions this year. So you all, we do have the ability to create an emergency regulation. So on short notice, we could modify our shed antler season. It would require approval of the, the commission president and then a signature by the governor to, to modify that, uh, that regulation. So let me, let me give you a quick and dirty rundown of conditions and our current recommendation from our field folks. And, and then a propose, proposal for you all to consider as we move forward. So if we start in the Laramie region and work our way west, in the Laramie region right now, things have opened up considerably. Just last week, we had some several good warm days and, and some wind, and it, and it helped considerably. So the Laramie region is in, is in better condition than they were just a couple of weeks ago. That's about where the good news ends. And as we move further west, we see that winter conditions are just really hanging in there. We still, we've seen some country open up south of Wam Sutter, but there's still a lot of snow on the ground. And for the most part in uh, Green River and the Pinedale regions, big game animals are still on their, on their winter ranges. They're, they're not moving. They're not showing any indications that they're gonna move. And the conditions on the ground are such that it doesn't look like things are going to change much in the next week or two. The, the one exception would be in Teton County. In Teton County, we're primarily concerned about elk moving off feed grounds and back into transition ranges. In Teton County, things are opening up a little bit. Elk can start to move to some transition uh, ranges. That's, that's one place where we might want to consider an exception. But looking ahead, if we were to make a recommendation to you today, it, it's, our, our recommendation would be that we do move forward with a, an emergency regulation and postpone the opening of the shed antler season. But what I'd like to recommend to you today is that we take one more week and come back next Monday with a final recommendation. Uh, that'll give us time to continue to assess conditions this week. And also, if we did move forward with a emergency rule, it would give us a better assessment as to what date to push that shed antler uh, closure through. So with that, I stand for any questions that you might have. Um, yeah, I have some questions. 
Rick, so typically in the Green River Pinedale area, typically when do our big game species leave their winter range? Yeah, they I start into their transitional ranges. Yeah, typically by the end of March, we start to see conditions change significantly. And you'll start to see animal movements off those winter ranges. So they're behind a month, they're delayed a month. And then I guess my concern is just because the ground opens up and the snow's gone, there's nothing else to eat anywhere. So that's maybe they're not ready to move yet anyway. So that, that's a, a good point is that right now we're in a lot of places we're still seeing animals very much tied to their their the heart of their winter ranges. Mm -hmm. And it would it would take a lot significant amount of snow melt for that to change dramatically mm -hmm. over the next two weeks to the point where they start to move off of those winter ranges and into transition areas. Mm -hmm. Snow's deep at low elevations and it's deeper than really deep at high. My other thought was if is there any problem with enforcement to your staff if we do a delayed start, delay the season start? President Brokaw, absolutely. That's a good question. Uh, the workload for our shed antler season is significant. It's a huge burden for our folks and it's a, and it's a burden on them for several months. And so any delay absolutely creates an additional workload for us, but our field personnel are, are up to the challenge. They, they've had a long winter already. So um, as, as long as we can provide that Caribbean vacation in July for them, there you go. They'll, they'll, they'll get her done. They'll hang and rattle with us. Yep. Any uh, other commissioners have questions for Rick? Present. Yes, sir. And so I would encourage us for, to delay it as long as we can because we'll see an influx of Utah uh, shed hunters coming into the southwest Wyoming. Uh, it's, next year we'll have a problem with the over, but overcrowding as far as the shed hunting because uh, the seven day buffer is going to come into effect. This year it's not going to come into effect. So my point is, is Utah is going to shed on May 1st, and then we're going to delay it. So my, my recommendation is the further we can push it down to give the wildlife more time to disperse. And so it would be the better we'd be off. So uh, I think we're going to have a big influx again this year from out of state. So delay it a little bit further. Any other questions? Mr. President, I would just going to ask Rick, um, What's that media campaign look like? How do we get the word out to everybody? And, and I would agree with what Commissioner Roberts said on that. And, and the earlier, the better that we can start that process. And then, um, you know, making sure that, that folks also understand the deadhead rule, because um, there's going to be more of those out there too. Just a thought. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing on deadheads. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, President Brokaw, Commissioner Bell, very good point in, in that uh, I'm, I'm confident that our communication section will pull out all the stops to get the messaging done that we need to. So you're, you're, what action are you asking of us today? So President Brokaw, I would, I would just ask for your general support that we come to you a week from today with a final recommendation on an emergency regulation for shed antler collection. Is the commission comfortable with that recommendation? I am as well, so we'll look forward to that next week. Hopefully there'll be some sunshine between now and then. Thank you. So Mr. President, just a couple more quick points to kind of wrap this topic up. Um, one thing I didn't mention is, is that um, the, the number of days that were cold was significantly higher this year. There's some data at the Pinedale Airport that indicates in a normal year, normal winter, 39 days are below zero in Pinedale at the airport. This year there were 62, and that was as of um, March, middle to late March. So significantly colder. And then the other thing, Senator Hicks at our Rollins Town Hall meeting um, had a significant amount of data where he looked at 
um, snowpack at the higher elevations versus snowpack at the lower elevations. One of the anomalies this year was is that the, the snowpack was higher at lower elevations um, in, in a lot of cases than it was at the higher elevations. Some higher elevation snowpack was close to normal, whereas the, the stuff down on the critical winter ranges was much higher. So you couple that deep snow with longer cold temperatures and it just created this um, extremely extreme mortality event. And the other thing I think that's always important to kind of put things in perspective is, you know, 100 years ago, um, we were in a we were in a spot in Wyoming and in most of the country where wildlife populations were um, were down to nearly the numbers are far below what they are today, even after this bad winter. Um, you know, there were some estimates where there were only 10,000 pronghorn in the entire state. There even there, there weren't even very many elk in the state, and because of um, wildlife management techniques, regulation on take, and funding from sportsmen, you know, those populations um, came, to, came to be what we know of going today. And, you know, by the 60s and 70s, um, there was significant hunting opportunity in our state. And so it's, I think it's just always important to keep in perspective that these things happen. It's not good when it happens. We don't like it. Um, but there is hope and a light at the end of the tunnel that, that we'll be able to recover big game populations in Wyoming. Um, a couple other quick updates I wanted to provide. So we are um, right now in the process of um, soliciting, or actually we just, uh, we just um, approved the new fellows for our fellowship program that we do with the Hobbs School over at the University of Wyoming. This is something we started about three years ago where um, the department offers um, a, this partnership program where students compete and those that um, do well and are selected five per year are able to be um, in this fellowship. And what it what allows them to do is they receive, receive a scholarship and they also um, have requirements to do volunteer work and have a pretty close association with the department. And then two of their summers through their college experience, um, this program requires them to work for us in, a, in some capacity. And we've, got, we've had them do a variety of different seasonal kind of jobs it's given, you know, the, the intent is to provide um, more wildlife students to have exposure to the department and what we do, and also for us to be able to have interactions with these people um, with the hopes that it helps us with recruiting over the long term, that we can have form relationships early on with students at our own university and, um, and, and hopefully get some of those folks wearing red shirts and, and driving green trucks. So we're up to 15 of those fellows now. And... Um, the program is going, going, going very well. Um, we will, you'll get an update for, from Nish and then also Josh Corsi on mule deer days. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the, the statistics, but I did just wanna give a shout out to all those folks who put that together. And despite um, some challenges with roads and, um, and weather, um, I thought that event was, was exceptionally well done. Um, I know that in talking with Josh, they've got some things that they wanna tweak that they feel like they could do better. Um, we certainly are evaluating it from our end as well and things that we can do better. Um, but I'm very happy with the way that that event went off. And I really appreciate the commission's involvement in, and, being, and participating in that. It, that. That was well noted by many folks. Last thing I've got here today, Mr. President, is many of you may have seen, I think we um, provided some of this information to you. We were asked to testify in the House Natural Resources Subcommittee on Water, Wildlife and Fisheries on a bill that was um, introduced by um, Congresswoman Hegeman to delist the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem grizzly bear population um, and to protect that decision uh, from judicial review. We did put some testimony together, written testimony, and I went out and testified in front of that, that committee, and um, now it's in their hands to see where that, that bill may go. There are um, very similar companion bills in the Senate, um, but uh, they haven't worked through the process yet. With that, Mr. President, I would stand for any of your questions. Okay, Mr. Director, I do have a question. <clears throat> if we go back to the elk in camera or for our emergency feeding, I've had several questions that are we now going to have resident elk there that were not traditionally there or because of the feeding or now that it gets back to spring and summer, those elk will go back to their traditional range. I would say it, it will be a mix. And we have seen times when elk have found 
new habitats, new space, that they return to that the following year, even if the conditions don't necessarily um, require them to move to those lower elevations. So I suspect that there will be some, some memory there for some of those groups of elk, um, but certainly um, I, I wouldn't say that would be the case for the majority. And we will be working closely with landowners if we do have elk show back up where we don't really want them in the winter that we work to mitigate those problems. That was my reply that we would be, we would stay on top of it. We wouldn't just quit and go away. So, you know, I did forget one point and, and you made me think of it for some reason. Um, I just want you all to be aware of the direction that I gave our team um, with the department. I, I told them that um, there was no reason or, um, and that my expectation was that they not consider um, revenue at, or declines in revenue when they set um, and proposed seasons to you. So we know there's gonna be a, a financial impact. We'll deal with that later. I asked them to make the most appropriate um, season recommendations for wildlife and, and we'll deal with the revenue part of that later. I echo those thoughts I want, when I've talked to the commission that certainly my focus is gonna be on the biological need more so than financial doesn't even, is not an issue. We need to take care of our critters first, so. Now this commission has set aside an operational reserve to deal with situations like this, you know, yeah. a rainy day. Bumps in the road. Uh, any other commissioners have questions for Director Nesvik? One thing, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Um, uh, Director, I just want to compliment on, and especially in my district, on the, the supervisors. And, and I can't express enough gratitude on how hard that your department is working from the supervisors down to biologists to everybody. Uh, I mean, literally, people haven't had even time off for like two months they've been doing. You've been getting sources all around the state. Everybody's been coming in to help out on everything. And, and it speaks so highly. And I know everybody has their own uh, thoughts about it. But I just want to say that I know for a fact how hard this department's been working to get through this, uh, this terrible thing that we're going through the winter. So I applaud each and every one of them. And I wish we could give them all medals because it's just amazing. And, and I'm just really proud of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Roberts. Any other questions? Mr. President, um, just sure. real quick. Um, first of all, my apologies for my phone. I thought I silenced it and I didn't. So my apologies, Director Nesbitt. Um, the Hobbs School Fellows, can you give me just 30 seconds on what, what are they doing um, either during the school year or in the off season? Yeah, so during the school year, the volunteer work involves some things like, you know, routine department activities like um, attending a check station and working at a game and fish check station in the fall. Um, they've had the opportunity to, to um, go to the lab. They've had the opportunity to go to our research center in Sabeel. Um, in the summertime, there have been a variety of different, um, both fisheries technician jobs, um, wildlife technician jobs. We've even got one of the fellows, I believe, is going to work at the camp um, on educational wildlife ed conservation educational um, activities this summer. And um, I think we've even got a person coming to do um, fiscal work this summer. And so it's just a, it's a variety of different opportunities around the department. And, you know, part of this too is, is to hopefully be able to um, maybe loosen up some of the workload too for some of our folks in places where we have workload issues. Thank you, director. Thank you, Mr. President. Very good. All righty, sir. All right, I'll move on to the next you agenda may. item. And it's my absolute honor today to make the presentation on the Game and Fish Department's uh, 2022 Industry Wildlife Stewardship Award. So um, here a few years ago, um, Deputy Director Bruce and Deputy Director Kennedy and I were um, evaluating some of the great work that gets done by some of our partners in industry around the state um, specific to wildlife. And so we decided it was a, you know, a small token that we could provide to those folks who really go above and beyond when in, the, in their normal work to do great things for wildlife and to um, develop whatever particular industry they're in to develop their um, and, and operate their business in a way that um, is responsible and keeps wildlife in mind. And this year, I have the honor to um, tell you all that EOG Resources Incorporated 
is our 2022 recipient. We have them here today, several representatives from the company. And before I have them come up, I think they wanna address the, the commission here. Um, in fact, I know they do. I did wanna just talk about some of the great things that EOG has done. Um, they have demonstrated a proactive approach, wildlife surveys and conservation in Wyoming and all, of, all that they do. Um, they voluntarily, voluntary being a key word here, monitor wildlife resources across hundreds of square miles in their area of interest in northwest or northeastern Wyoming. And, and this is an approach that's, as I said before, it's well beyond the standard or the expectation um, that, that are required. Um, because of their efforts, EOG has been able to develop an avian monitoring and mitigation plan, which incorporates more than 12 years of raptor nest survey data, um, raptor prey based surveys, and Frugenus hawk GPS data which um, is used to inform their long range planning and activities. Um, this avian monitoring and mitigation plan has proven extremely valuable for wildlife and land management agency planning activities as well. Additionally, um, EOG has been actively involved in sagebrush um, habitat restoration activities in the Powder River Basin um, during the past several years and in collaboration with the BLM um, Buffalo Field Office. They've contributed both financial support and substantial manpower to the Buffalo Field Office's efforts to plant sagebrush seedlings in reclamation areas. And they've also worked to develop a Powder River Basin specific seed mix, which has shown great success in establishing native grasses while excluding invasive grasses and weeds. EOG continually strives to reduce environmental impacts and emissions associated with their exploration and development processes. They incorporate a number of voluntary best management practices in Wyoming including using closed loop drilling systems, building multi-well pads to minimize surface disturbance and incorporating pipelines to min minimize truck traffic using high technology measures to monitor and reduce emissions at wells, resulting in a 51% reduction in methane emissions since 2019, as well as many other measures. So due to their work and being proactive and um, developing and, and operating their business responsibly, um, can't think of anybody more well deserving of this um, this small token of our appreciation. So I would ask uh, the EOG folks to come on up. Excellent. We hope you can find a, an appropriate place to display on this summer. <laughs> And, and we've also got a plaque for uh, that, that highlights the award. Certainly, the mic is yours. Good morning. UG is very honored and appreciative uh, to receive the 2022 Industry Wildlife Stewardship Award. We take great pride in our efforts to protect and conserve Wyoming species and their habitats. UG makes wildlife stewardship a key priority in our decision-making processes, and we work closely with stakeholders to collaborate on conservative conservation initiatives that certainly go above and beyond the base regulatory requirements. There are two key areas which we are especially proud of our employees' conservation efforts. The first, is our long-term study to monitor the migration territory and nesting patterns of ferruginous hawks, or raptor species that nest throughout our Powder River Basin. Data from this study informs our programmatic avian plan, which helps us manage our projects in a matter that protects and conserves biological integrity, avian populations, and their habitat. The second I'd like to highlight is our extensive reclamation and seeding work in multiple basins throughout Wyoming. In the Powder River specifically, we have collaborated with local stakeholders to reclaim land previously used as water reservoirs to restore native sagebrush grasslands and over 400 acres to date. Of course, all the efforts recognized throughout this award wouldn't be possible without our partnership with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department our federal agencies, and all the other key stakeholders who value conservation and wildlife programs. We certainly look forward to continuing these important alliances and conservation efforts. Thank you very, very much 
for this award. We are very grateful and very humbled to receive it. Thank you. We'd like to do a picture of your... We would like that as well. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You need Ralph. Yeah. Let's include, let's get Ralph in there real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah get the like, president up there. Help us. Thank you. We need okay. to get, yep. I have the president. This up. I should have the president. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, that completes our agenda that we're going to tackle before lunch. Are there any new sheets? Anybody online that wants to make change? Any comments from the public? Okay, very well. We'll adjourn for lunch. Uh, hold on. I got to read John. Okay, yes. We can buy here. Okay, we do have public comment from S. Clark. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you guys going to address the antler opener for May 1st? Yes, we, we had a presentation by Chief King on that, and the commission's decision was to, to wait another week and see how the weather changes, get more data from field personnel, do an emergency rule next Monday on it. Okay, thank you. Yep, stay tuned. The Department of Communications will put out uh, a very thorough, broad-based informational thing as soon as the commission makes that decision next week. Anyone else, Wayne? Okay, meeting adjourned. We'll resume back here at 1.15. As people are getting a seat, we're going to call this meeting back to order. Commissioner's reminder, your red light means you're hot, not quiet. On our agenda this afternoon, um, if you're following along, agenda item number four is um, not coming to us today. It'll be further down, probably June, maybe July meeting. And so if... Chief Wiltanger is ready. Sir, you are next. All right, sounds like it's on. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. President, Director Nesvik, members of the commission, Eric Wiltanger, Chief of Services. Just a real brief update today on the Jackson Housing Project. Um, things are moving quite along quite well. And uh, as of the last commission meeting I briefed you, we have changed it down to six units. One seasonal, um, the infrastructure and the civil plans are just continuing right along. Um, I think last month, you probably recall, I mentioned to you that I was probably coming in April for an ask of a deposit um, that has changed in a good way because the GMP, the gross maximum price that we receive in June, we've talked to the uh, modular contractor and they're just gonna accept that after we get the GMP, which really plays well for us. We'll know the total price of what it's gonna cost and then we'll come to the commission at the June retreat to ask, make that ask for the deposit once we know what it is. And that's really the only update I have, unless you have any questions. I don't, any questions from the commission? Very good, thank you, Eric. I'm anxious to see what that bid comes in at. Hopefully it's tolerable. Chief Phipps, fiscal division. Talk about some license selling agents. What have you got? Uh, this agenda item is uh, recommend. Mr. Uh, President, you just want to just turn your mic on. 
turn my mic off. Yeah. Red is good. Is that better? Hot. There we go. That's good. Uh, <laughs> the department's recommending the commission vote to approve a new appointment of a licensed selling agent. Uh, and that's Bear Lodge, located at Burgess Junction uh, in the Bighorns. And um, there's currently not a licensed selling agent there. The closest one is uh, in Dayton uh, on one side of the mountain or uh, level on the other side. So um, there is no cell service on the mountain. So folks, you know, with all the fishing activity and the outdoor activity there, uh, it, it makes sense to have a licensed selling agent there. In Dayton, last year's sales were about $49,000. And um, anyhow, recommended vote to approve. Any questions from the commission? It's a pleasure of the commission. Second. Moved by Commissioner Roberts, second by second. Commissioner Bell. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to accept say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Go ahead, sir. Uh, the next agenda item, Mr. President, is um, we're requesting the commission authorization to transfer up to 6% of the lifetime license fund mm -hmm. to the Game and Fish Commission's operating fund for FY23. Um, you're not required to by statute, it says May. Um, and currently the lifetime balance fund at the end of March was $6,903,025. Uh, the estimated balance of the lifetime license fund at the end of May is projected at $6,986,493 or $6,986,000. Anyway. About 6.9 million. Uh, the estimated 6% at the end of May would be $419,190. Um, so again, the commission doesn't have to approve the transfer, uh, but if you decide to leave it in the lifetime license fund, you won't be able to go back and uh, get it approved later. Um, and the reason why the department's recommending the approval of the 6% is it goes into the operation fund um, for future use. Question, Mr. Phipps. So if we didn't transfer it out today, it would stay there. We couldn't access a transfer again for another year? For next year's. You can do this once a year, Mr. Okay. President. Okay, that's what I thought. Questions? Concerns? Um, May ahead, I, Mr. Go ahead, President? Um, if we can, uh, if we're limited to doing this once a year, um, doing the 6% now and we end up somewhere down the road, needing more, you know, and if, I guess, let me ask it this way. Are we estimating right now with an, an unknown number coming down the road and creating a problem that way? I'm sure you've thought it through. I'm just curious what you think. Mr. President, Commissioner Masterson, uh, no, we're not anticipating that problem. And um, and this this is just for, the lifetime license fund um, to where you can allocate 6% of that into the operating fund for the year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Phipps, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically we do that, don't we? Annually, on an annual basis? Mr. President, uh, yes. Typically, that's the, uh, uh, the recommendation from the department and past commission actions. Any other commissioners have a question? Chief Phipps? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the commission? Make a motion that we transfer 6% of the lifetime license fund balance to the operating fund. Moved by Commissioner Ladwig, is there a second? Second by Commissioner Lundball. Any further discussion? 
Seeing, hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to transfer the 6% say aye. Opposed? Aye. That motion carries. Would you like to stay, Chief Phipps? I know you're not on the agenda. But... I would, Mr. President. There is a, a third issue from budgetary perspective that uh, we'd like to address, and that involves uh, hay and feeders. Uh, obviously, with the winter that we've had, we've had a lot of emergency feeding. Um, and I, I come with come to you for a request for the FY 2023 budget for feed grounds and feeders to increase those budgets by $125,000. Uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. So, on the next season of gas This, this is the <clears throat> current budget we're dealing with right now. Is that going to be enough? Mr. President, Commissioner Roberts, yes. Any other questions? All right. How do you want to do it? Mr. President, I would I would make a motion to approve the increase of $125,000 for hay and feeders in the current 2023 budget. There's a motion to accept the department's recommendation. Is there a second? I would second. Second by right. Commissioner Masterson. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. Anything else, Chief Phipps? No, Mr. President, thank you. We are 25 minutes ahead of schedule. If you want to stay there and talk some more. As our next presenter gets up here, I will just have her introduce herself so I don't butcher it. All right, good afternoon, Nish. Good oh. afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Good afternoon, President Brokaw, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. I'm Nish Koikwalea. I'm the Communications and Education Chief with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And today I'm presenting on the department's education and outreach programs from 2022, and also some upcoming 2023 projects and initiatives. Maybe. We may be having a slight technical difficulty. Can you That's give me right. one second? Sir? Absolutely, no problem. While Nish is getting the IT guys hooked up, lined up, uh, for any of those presenters that are watching via Zoom or the internet on the phone, if you have comments, be sure you get them to the administrator to get those comments before this commission. If you're in the audience and you want to speak on a topic, don't forget to do a blue sheet at the back table. If anybody has chocolate, Richard and I don't have any chocolate. Here. <laughs> uh, to uh, Miss Bell, Miss Bell, I like a little chocolate in the afternoon. <laughs> Just make a note of that. Yeah. Dark. Special dark. Yeah. Um, heart healthy. Got to be heart healthy. I second that. <laughs> Not that hungry yet. I had a big old sandwich. Had lunch at that chair. Thank you. Good position, Tate. Right 
Ben? Order, Commission. Order. Yes, ma'am. You may proceed. President Brokaw, members of the Commission, I apologize. Director Nesbitt, it should be online in two seconds. No problem. Thank you for the delay. So I am presenting on the 2022 report for all of the departments, education and outreach events, stats, things like that. And then I also wanted to share kind of our upcoming projects and initiatives that we're working on now for 2023. All right, Nish, I do see that Senator Driscoll, Senator, President of the Senate has joined us. Welcome, Senator. It's a nice warm day in Casper. All right, Nish. Perfect. So education and outreach is embedded in the department's strategic plan. And so just to kind of give an overview on that, um, part of the strategic plan is to enhance and maintain and develop partnerships engaging and informing and listening to those who enjoy Wyoming's fish and wildlife. Our goal was to improve communications, outreach and education, foster appreciation, engagement and understanding of fish and wildlife conservation, and use education as a means for public understanding of the role we all play in conservation. The other goal is to encourage and promote diverse fish and wildlife based experiences for all users and support and facilitate activities, opportunities, hunting, angling, trapping, and promote quality and diverse fish and wildlife based experiences other than hunting, fishing and trapping. And so this is where all of these programs lie within the department's strategic plan. So last year, and this is just the data that we've recorded, we collect data from all of the department staff on a monthly basis of whether or not they've engaged in outreach events or education events, whether we know about it through the education team or the regional information education specialists or other people who are often in part of education. And so this is really great data. Last year, we reached over 30,000 participants. We had over 19 hours facilitating programs and 423 education and outreach programs. So um, of these programs, the majority of these were delivered to pu general public of all ages as the most common audience, followed by adults, then middle schoolers, and then high school and elementary age youth. This was a significant increase in the number of programs since 2021. In fact, it was up 256%, which is really normal. And I didn't put that on the slide because we just come out of COVID. 2021 was kind of a slow emerging year for us in terms of outreach. However, we can definitely tell that we're back in it now. The average program reported was somewhere around five hours on average that the department did. And the bulk of these programs were content-based presentations on wildlife, fish, habitat, ecology, and management, followed by hunter education, and then public relations events, followed by skills-based skills lessons on hunting, angling, shooting, outdoor safety, and then lastly, facility tours. So think of your hatcheries, those kinds of things. Camp is another major contributor to our education. And Whiskey Mountain Conservation Camp last year, we had nine camps, two were youth, one becoming an outdoors woman, five family camps, one educator camp. We had a total of 177 participants. This year, we're going to have 10 camps with an extra becoming an outdoors woman camp. We had 197 applications of women who wanted to go to our Becoming an Outdoors Woman camp, and we only had slots, even with the additional camp this year, for 100. So we know there's a need there, and we're gonna work on that in the coming years. You can also see that we rebranded camps. So we have a new logo with Ski Mountain Conservation Camps, and it's pretty catchy, and we like that, and all of our camp uh, attendees will be receiving items with both this and the department and the Inspire Kit logo on it.
So of all of our camps, there was representation from 18 counties. 88% of all the families that attended our family camp said they would be spending more, more time outside. And everybody, 100% satisfaction of participants, whether they were very satisfied or satisfied. We did not have any of our camp attendees who said they were at, at all disgruntled with camp. Of our youth, 21 of our 22 youth campers said they are interested in careers with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And 100% of our educators are more likely to take students outdoors. Our educator camp really focuses on embedding conservation curriculum within the schools and how it relates to different standards for the state. And so we're really excited that um, there's an increase in that as well. Yes, sir. And I'm sorry, I, did, I, I know you're, I didn't know if I should read um, questions and tell you that I know. Yes, Mr. President, I don't know what your preference is. But what the heck? Whatever. If um, Nish is comfortable with questions now, go ahead. Um, I'm curious about the educators and how you contact them and how you how you get them involved. Are you you work through school districts, mm -hmm. um, uh, education association? I'm just curious how you get them. Mr. President and Commissioner Masterson. So we do all of those things. And actually we really ramped up our marketing and communications with the schools this year more than ever. And so we send out all of our education opportunities, whether it's for youth or educators through the school emails. So we email all the schools, superintendents, teachers, everybody along the line, school counselors as well. And then also we have regional public relations specialists in every region, and they work really closely with their local schools, and they typically have a very close relationship. And so some of it's organic, and then some of it we do spend, we spend a lot of time this year in particular trying to get a hold of the schools. And I can give you another example that I'll be reporting on next year, but um, at the end of next week is our conservation stamp art show. And this year we were really creative, and we actually worked with PTSB to email all the art teachers in the state for the first time ever specifically instead of kind of general email to everybody and so we're working on some of those things. Um, we utilize the um, American Fish and Wildlife um, curriculum Project Wild for our educator camp so it is a recognized curriculum conservation curriculum that's designed for K-12 so you can break it down in different lesson plans. So when our educators go through the camp they get that certification to utilize the curriculum and then the department works with Project Wild group to supply that. So it's a really great partnership with a lot of different moving parts. Thank you. Free Fishing Day is one of our kind of biggest sometimes hands-on, sometimes hands-off outreach events we do with the public. So every year, the first weekend in June, I believe, is our free fishing day. And so I just wanted to, we tried this year for the first time to really capture the data around the regions with the department. And so you can see that we had over 300 participants in Cody, 35 in Dubois, 300 in Jackson, 50 in Pinedale, 50 in Lander, 140 in Riverton, 50 in Kemmer, 75 in Evanston, 60 in Rock Springs, 306 in Casper and 383 participants that we know of in Cheyenne. And you'll see that Sheridan's not on there. And that doesn't mean that they don't do anything with Free Fishing Day. Quite the contrary. They do a lot of partnership work, um, but not host a standalone event. Staff there have been working with um, specifically with the Cody events and Trout Unlimited and the Forest Service. And this year, our Moorcraft Moorcraft. Gordon will be helping at an event at Keyhole. So these are just the numbers that we were able to collect where our staff had some kind of engagement or involvement, but we know these numbers are way higher because there's different entities that utilize that as well. So, but it's still pretty exciting. I wanted to give a shout out again to Maury Brown Kids Fishing Day. And this was a really awesome fishing experience, I would say that was a partnership between the Wildlife Fund, Maury Brown, ourselves, and a number of other partners. Uh, last year was our first year doing this, and it was on the Maury Brown Ranch at the Bell Reservoir. And it was just a really, really outstanding event. And we had 383 participants, 
Of those 205 were kids, 178 were adults, 28 volunteers, and that doesn't even include the wildlife fund staff or the department staff. And we also, as of good note, had one Game and Fish commissioner there, Commissioner Jolovich. And so it was a really great event and we're gonna do it again and uh, something we look forward to. So hunter education statistics for 2022. In 2022, we had 362 instructors, 4,095 students were certified, and we offered 183 classes across the state. Of those, we had 38 new instructors last year who donated 6,303 hours volunteering for us. So hunter education is predominantly run by volunteer instructors and department staff. And we're working really hard to increase these numbers for volunteers and also with schools. This year, we have kind of launched a new program where we're offering training opportunities around the state to get more hunter education instructors trained, and then also kind of do refresher courses for our longstanding instructors, especially since we know, you know, the COVID years, there was not a lot of hunter education there. So of the students certified, we were able to see that 2,392 of them took the traditional 100 hands-on face-to-face class. 1,112 completed the hybrid course, so it's partly online, and then they complete a field day with us. And then 591 students were, received their hunter certification in schools. And then we also had 37 bow hunter certified students, which is not a requirement in Wyoming, but it's something that we're working really hard to increase, especially with bow hunters of Wyoming. And um, some of the other states are offering dual courses where they do hunter education and bow hunter certification in tandem. And so we're looking at some more opportunities for that as well. So here's a kind of a couple of nice pictures of the classes we offered. So you can see those again. And then our class size has increased dramatically. So we used to be around the average was 15 to 18, and now we're up to 22 to 25. We do have a cap on that just to try to contain it for both the instructors and for space needs as well. But uh, we launched in October of 2021, a new registration software that has allowed us to really track this, market this really differently. And now we'll be able to, in the coming years, tell you when a student takes hunter certification with us, whether or not they went hunting and they kept hunting and how you know that went in different directions and track that data for recruitment, retention and reactivation. So we're really excited about that. Hunter education in schools. We had 21 schools who did hunter education with us in 2022. We offered 25 courses and 591 students successfully attained their hunter certificate with us. It's at school or after school or kind of in a conjunction there. And this is a variety of grade levels. Typically we see this somewhere between fifth grade all the way up to 12th grade. And um, sometimes there are full courses in the school. Sometimes there are partial courses in the school and then a field day with us. And then some of them are after school programs. So our new initiatives and goals for 2023 is that we definitely want to increase hunter education in schools. We are working very closely for with the National Archery in Schools program to expand that program. We have a new education request form that's digital and online on our website and available to the public. We are expanding our conservation crates. We're doing a program with Trout in the Classroom in conjunction with the Fish Division and Trout Unlimited. And we've updated our Y Hunt Fish program logo, and we've added more partners to this program. So along the increase for hunter education in schools, um, one of the big things that we're doing right now is we are talking to the Wyoming Department of Education, the State Board of Education, and the Professional Teaching Standards Board. And we're hoping to make sure that we are able to provide um, how all of our education programs, whether it's hunter education in school, archery in school programs, or the trout in the classroom program ties into the standards that are required for education in Wyoming, so that educators can see 
the usefulness of these hands-on hands -on activities in their school and provide all the curriculum built for that age level so that the teachers can implement it without any greater workload on them. Um, the other thing that we're discussing right now with the Professional Teaching Standards Board is working on a Hunter Education endorsement that can be applied to a teaching license. So instead of it being through a certification just through us, it would be recognized through the state of Wyoming and the education side. And so I'm sure I'll be back to tell you how that is going in the future. The National Archery in Schools program, we used to be quite involved with this program a number of years ago, and then it kind of dropped off. And so we're picking it back up. We have a number of schools, I think there's 22 to be exact, that are still doing the National Archery in Schools program. However, without the department's involvement, it's very difficult to expand this program because you have to be trained by a department person to train an instructor and go forward and build onto this. Archery in Schools is a really cool program because it does not increase liability for schools. Typically, they do it during PE, and it's a skills-based course, but then we're also able to build in conservation ethics and hunter safety and things like that as well. Oh, I should go back and tell you. So this fall, this coming year, we have a goal to increase our school number by 20 for Archery in Schools and to really be thoughtful about, you know, kind of working out the programmatic kinks, I will say, so that we can have it more standardized and continue to recruit more schools going forward as an opportunity if they want to. Education request form, that is live and available right now on our current website. We haven't advertised this a whole bunch because we wanted to make sure we could see how it was working. It's a really great way for anybody in any community to say, hey, I want somebody from Game and Fish to come talk to my club, my group, my school, my class, whatever, about whatever topic. And then it gets routed to the appropriate person in that region and in that office. And so far, the other great thing about this is that we're able to track how many requests we're receiving and how well we are responding to them. Conservation crates. We've had conservation crates for a number of years, and this is kind of just a crate. We typically have had pelts and skulls, and we've had an opportunity where a school teacher could check these out from a regional office from one of our IMEs and utilize them in the classroom. We just received a grant for the coming year to expand this program. And so we will also have, the goal of this is to have a curated group of lessons that allows us to reach children across all the state without any increase in department workload. Like you check out the crate from us, we provide the curriculum, we provide all of the necessary supplies, the lesson plans, the topics, and then you can implement this. And it's per the correct grade as well. And then the teachers can implement this in their classes. This coming year with our grant funding, we are going to also have a migration and habitat crate, wildlife and fisheries management crate, invasive species and diseases crate, animal adaptions, large carnivore and safety crate, and then again, we're updating our traditional pelts and skulls grades. So we're really excited about that. And again, back to Trout in the Classroom. Trout in the Classroom is a national program through Trout Unlimited. It's been around for about 32 years. There's a number of other states that have been doing this, but we think there's a lot of opportunity to be able to do it here as well. We had, I think, three schools last year that tried this out. And so what you do is the school has to make a small investment to get the supplies, typically an aquarium, those kinds of things. And then we provide them with the trout eggs from our hatchery, and then they grow their own trout. And then they talk about the life cycle and all of that. We're gonna launch this in January of the coming year. And then in May, um, there'll be that, that year concludes. And then the following year, they could grow new fish with their new class as well. So we're gonna start with a pilot program for 20 schools around the state. We have a few logistic things we know we need to work out and we're working really closely with Trout Unlimited and then the fisheries divi fish division, excuse me. And so, but we think this will be a really awesome way for any school that's interested. The last thing I wanted to touch on, our Why Hunt Fish program. This has been a department program for a long time. We've given it a facelift. We have a new logo. You can see that we have, you know, antlers and hooks there, but they're also the W and the Y. 
why hemp fish. We're right now we just got this trademark with the state of Wyoming, and um, the goal of this program is really kind of an umbrella program that enables the department to be a support system with other partners. So and um, focusing on hunting and fishing skill development and mentorship. We have over 50 partners right now with this program. Some of our partners are far more active than others, but we are working on some expansion of this. And the whole goal of this is, again, just to get more people hunting and fishing in Wyoming. Last thing I wanted to touch on is just kind of give you an outline of our outreach events that we know are coming. And you will be receiving this commissioners um, in the email as well. So if there's ever an event in your area and you'd like to attend, we would love to have you. We have a ton of different events, as you can see, we kind of ramp up through the summer starting in May. And so um, I'll be sending you this list. And if, if you're interested in stopping in, again, we'd love to have you. All the way through mostly August and then a couple here in October and November. Thank you. The last part I'd want to touch on is um, I know Muley Fanatics was on their way. I'm not sure if Mr. Corsi's here. Um, we just finished the event with you all, as you know, for Mule Deer Days in Rock Springs that was in conjunction with the last commission meeting. And Muley Fanatics has all of their statistics from that event. And it was a really successful event, even though we did have a few hiccups with the weather and road closures. but. That's, we're hoping will be an annual event with us going forward. And so when Mr. Corsi is here, I hope we'll be able to give you some information about that. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, Mish. <clears throat> Your outdoor women camps, 197 applicants for 100 spaces. Mm -hmm. What's our limiting, what's, what limits us from doing service to more outdoor women? Is it time, is it money? So President Broca, you know, right now we're really tight on space and calendar space. So, and that's kind of the thing that we've been really trying to play with, but we have our camp booked solid from the time it opens until the time it closes. But we think we can be more creative going forward. We have been doing some other side projects to see what the interest level is. And I can give you an example. In the Laramie region, we offered a women's series starting in January that goes all the way through May and each month, 25 women can register for this series. The first month was ice fishing, learning to ice fish, how to do it, what you need, supplies, all that kind of stuff. I believe the second month was meat processing. There's rifle cleaning. I don't remember the other two, but that event sold out as well. And when I say sell out, we only charged a $5 a nominal fee just so people will come. But, um, and to pay for snacks and supplies. However, we do know that there is a need. And so we're working on some women's hunts for this fall with um, some different groups, um, mentored to get more women into these activities. And then I think that we will probably expand our women's series, our monthly women's series across the state or at least move it around the state so that we can try to have an incre increase in there, so. I think you're your programs are wildly successful and everything you presented is top notch. Your Whiskey Mountain logo, that's beautiful. Um, you do a very good job in your whole department. And, and when you were at Fox Springs at the Muley Fanatic thing, I went over to the Inspire Kid building. I was in there for an hour. I was fascinated at all that. And it's tough to be a kid trying to migrate through her little torture course. I, I really, Yes, your creativity is excellent. Love it all. Very well done. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Good. President. I'm very, very fortunate to work with so many passionate, talented people that do all the hard work on the day and day, and then I get to come and tell you all about it, which is the lucky part. It's pretty cool. Yeah, Commissioner. Yeah, one little thing. My friend in middle school had the proper classroom. I got a little letter from him and a little sheet with a bunch of pictures. They were, the kids were absolutely fascinated with that. They loved every minute of it. That's a great thing. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions, sir? Um, the becoming an outdoor woman, um, just to carry the president's question a little bit further. Um, 
how is it a program that women belong to and then they're given these opportunities to something that they find online and then look for? Mr. President, Commissioner Masterson, so this is a national program. We call it Bow Lovingly In-House, Becoming an Outdoors Woman. However, within the state of Wyoming, we run the program and then women apply to the program and they are randomly selected. This year, however, we put in the stipulation because we had so many applicants that we were looking for pre primarily Wyoming women and first time women. And so they were given preference over the other applicants, but um, this is done, it, it, everybody does it in the other you know, game and fish agencies in other states, but they do it quite differently. Um, whether they're you know, teaching outdoor canoeing or kayaking or cooking, I mean, the, the area of topics is you know, endless of what we could do. We've ran a very standard program that my team's really great at at this point. Um, at Whiskey Mountain, but I think going forward, we're probably going, we've kind of grown out of that in some ways, and we'll have to expand to other areas and other opportunities for education, which is a great problem to have. Other facilities or? Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. We um, also, um, go ahead, I'm so please. Sorry. We also offer a Beyond Bow camp as well, which is the next level if you want to focus on like more in-depth skills, whether it's on hunting, angling, backpacking, other things outdoors. And so we've done that for a number of years as well. Well, I'm, um, I'm sure that uh, if, if you needed additional resources, we'd love to hear. Thank you. Thank sir. you for your good work. Thank you. Um, last question, Ish. So our hybrid, Hunter education course was very popular and we pushed it right into COVID. And then we had a backlog. We had a whole bunch of students um, certified on the computer, but they couldn't get their field day. Okay. And we caught up finally to that bottleneck of those kids that were- President Brokaw, we, have, we are completely caught up and we're finally in the great spot of expanding on that. Within the department, we had a Hunter education committee who you know, came together and gave a number of strategies to improve the program, catch up, and also be able to expand. And we have met all of those programmatic goals. And we're at the point where we're really focused on expanding into schools because we do, even though we have caught up on the backlog, we still have a greater demand than what we're able to provide due to staff limitations and volunteer limitations. And so we see the next opportunity is to really work with the schools, embedded in the schools, and then be able to increase the capacity of students that are certified, at least in that area, and still cater to, you know, adults and others that are coming into the hunting and angling field later in life. Very good. Good strategy. All righty, ma'am. I see nothing else. Thank you. Great presentation. Okay, hey, agenda item nine, Mr. McBarnes with the Wildlife Fund. Afternoon, Chris, how are you today? Afternoon, President Brokaw, members of the commission. Uh, honored to be here today. Chris McBarnes, uh, president of the Wildlife Fund. I want to congratulate uh, commissioners Masterson and Bell for joining. I apologize, all the roads were shut down to Rock Springs, so short of a helicopter, I was not getting there. And that's definitely not in our budget. So I um, want to congratulate you both and um, just give you a heads up, commissioners. Uh, two new commissioners. I definitely want to reach out to you and come sit down with a cup of coffee and tell you more about our organization and, and what we're doing for wildlife. And I was, um, director gave an excellent opener today to this meeting and it made me feel, it made me feel good because in our presentation, what you're going to see, I believe the wildlife fund is in lockstep coming out of this horrible, horrible, horrible winter we've had and doing our, our small part in helping wildlife across the state, because obviously there's not a silver bullet, but it's a team effort across the state. People are passionate. And I wanna make sure that our efforts are effective and timely and relevant. And based on his comments, I think you'll, I think you'll see that with where we're putting money um, in our efforts and initiatives. So just very briefly, um, I wanna give you a pooled migration fund uh, update. Secondly, I wanna give you a high level overview of the 
fundraising work that we and others have been doing on the Highway 189 South Kimmerer Wildlife Crossing Project, and then coalescing nicely with Nish's wonderful presentation, talk to you about uh, programming for our Inspire Kid Camps, um, and as Nish mentioned, the Maury Brown Kids Fishing Day coming up this June. Um, it's wonderful that we got sunshine and summer's on its way, and then uh, wrap up with just a, a brief um, little highlight on a big raffle that we have coming up here for the Wildlife Fund, a new model for us. And so the pooled migration fund, you all have heard of the USDA um, State of Wyoming Big Game Pilot Program. Secretary Vilsack and Governor Gordon signed a memorandum of understanding in Washington, D.C. this past October, unlocking an additional approximate $23 million in diverse farm bill funding across several different programs to benefit these key migration corridors, some of which um, have been catastrophically impacted uh, through this winter kill. And so what the Wildlife Fund did, uh, we applied to three major family foundations. We have two more major grant applications out right now to really be the, the private leg of this three-legged stool between the state and the federal government um, to help deploy these federal dollars and this wonderful opportunity. And at the end of the day, it's about keeping our working lands working, providing support to our hardworking ranchers that are providing the groceries uh, and the habitat for uh, our wildlife to thrive across Wyoming. We just got done carrying out a process implementing five different grant agreements with wonderful organizations, um, including the Wyoming Stock Growers Land Trust, the Jackson Hole Land Trust, the Nature Conservancy, the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, and the Western Landowners Alliance, uh, putting additional human capacity on the ground, $915,000, to go and develop meaningful relationships, trusting relationships with our producers in these corridors and connect them to, the, to this newfound federal funding opportunity. Now, I wanna give a huge shout out to Jill Randall with the department. Um, Director Nesvik and Deputy Director Bruce put, put Jill on the front end of the spear from the department level in coordinating this program. And she's done just an, an absolutely incredible job along with Brian Jensen and folks with USDA and NRCS. And so what's happening right now is, is the groups that we funded are having local coordination meetings led by Jill and NRCS with the local FSA folks, USDA folks to coordinate and implement this program and get dollars to where they need to be. And some things that we've talked about is, is when talking to our hardworking landowners and producers, um, it's definitely gonna have to be, it's definitely gonna have to be very meaningful because some of these individuals, they're, they're very leery of government. They've been burnt before in certain instances. And so rebuilding that trust, being completely honest and transparent, making sure we're staying in lockstep with the department and our federal partners to deploy these funds is gonna be so crucial. But what does it mean at the end of the day? It means more conservation easements. If you look at Park County right now and what's happening across the Absaroka front, Ashley, you're a realtor, you see it. You know The, the requests for subdivisions, through the roof. And if we don't do something to protect our critical habitat, we're gonna have 20 acre ranchettes across some of the most meaningful country in the state in regards to wildlife. That's why I'm so thankful that we chose the Jackson Hole Land Trust and the Wyoming Stock Growers Land Trust and are investing close to $400,000 in those organizations so we can get more conservation easements in place. The Environmental Quality Incentive Program, working with these landowners on wildlife friendly fence modifications, something Director Nesvik talked about, treating invasive annual grasses. So coming out of this winter, we're providing better habitat for our wildlife. Now, the second evolution of this is, is this. Even with some federal funds, and this is all voluntary, if, if private landowners don't want to do it or it's not right for them, hey, that is okay. This is just an opportunity, but there's still a private match in some of these programs. And so what the Wildlife Fund wants to do is, is come back with a second pot of money this fall to say, listen, if it makes sense, if you don't, if you do want to enter the program, but because the cost of living and, and inflation in the economy is too high, you still can't make that investment with the federal help. We want to step, step in and help further. So that's going to be the second evolution. But we're super excited about this program, more to come here. And we believe Wyoming can be a pilot for the rest of the West when it comes to this model. Highway 189 South Kimmer Wildlife Crossing Project. No one knows it better than uh, Commissioner Roberts. It's in his part of the world. Four to six new underpasses, one new overpass. I'm even more passionate about this project because it directly impacts two of the herds that have absolutely been devastated this winter. The Wyoming Range Mule Deer Herd and the Uinta Mule Deer Herd. Um, and so the Wildlife Fund has taken this on. My board of directors and Director Nesvik told me last fall, this is the next one. Go get it, Chris. Go get it. And so 
we've been working hard as a team, um, Nate and our board of directors uh, and partners to fundraise for this project. And so we do have some big announcements to make today. So as we stand today, um, with the help of partners, we've raised $868,000 for this project. Um, I've been working hard with the Knobloch Family Foundation since the 1st of January. We've developed a great relationship with those folks. Thank you to Steve Sharkey. Thank you to Nicole Corfanta. But the Wildlife Fund, we locked down our largest gift to date for a project. $600,000 for this project was approved. Um, two other notable gifts. I want to thank the Muley Fanatic Foundation, Mr. Josh Corsi, Mr. Joey Fagel, the Blue Ridge chapter of the Muley Fanatic Foundation out of Virginia. They were actually the first ones to donate to this project last year. A group of men and women from Virginia. That, that's how much Wyoming's wildlife means across this country. And so I, I want to thank Dave Cavanaugh and the Blue Ridge chapter, but Muley Fanatic Foundation, they're dedicating 92,000. Sean Blazak's in this room. Thank you, Sean. Uh, the Mule Deer Foundation is stepping up with 60,000. And there's been many other partners. Nate made a great announcement from some energy sector and mineral partners at the last meeting, but we're going to keep crunching. We're not satisfied with the 868, but we want to keep doing our part uh, so that it helps advance this project. This summer, um, we're so excited. So not only do we put money on the ground for wildlife, but like Nish said, there's restraints and how many kids that we can touch and inspire. And so we're hosting two Inspire Kid Camps this June at the Little Jenny Ranch. We've received applications. We're going to have kids from across Wyoming, Newark, New Jersey, West Virginia, and Mon inner city Monterey, California uh, to Wyoming. We're developing camp curriculum right now. We've got a host of speakers coming in. Director Nesvik is going to come in for two nights. Commissioner Lundball is going to come in for one night. We're so thankful for that. And then we're going to host 250 to 300 kiddos the first week in June at the Iron Mountain Ranch for the Maury Brown Kids Fishing Day. And it's been wonderful working with Nish and, and William Poole. I can't thank them enough for all their great support in helping us pull this off. It really is a team effort. Um, we've done some soft sign up so far, Nish, and I think we're going to go more public here in the next month. So if you have kids in that area of the state, um, stay tuned. Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's is partnering with us again. Every kid's going to get a stocked uh, tackle box and fishing pole. Um, Commissioner Jolovich, thank you for supporting this event. We couldn't do it without you. And First Northern Bank of Wyoming as well have been incredible. And then ju just to wrap up, um, to sustain our mission moving forward, we're going to, and this is just a part of it, like I approach fundraising, we've got our grassroots fundraising, we have our foundational grants and we have our major gifts. That's kind of the three prongs. And so from a grassroots standpoint, we're partnering with the Sportsman's Alliance. They're a group out of Ohio that does nationwide advocacy for sportsmen um, and, and hunters. Commissioner Lundvall, you might've heard of these folks. They're good folks. So we're gonna partner with them. We're doing a nationwide mega raffle it's going to include some commissioner licenses, guided hunts from the fine outfitters on the on the screen. Um, Johnny Morris at Bass Pro Shops has donated a ATV UTV uh, worth about sixteen thousand dollars. Swarovski's donated some amazing optics for this, so we're going to be rolling this out the first of May. Keep your eye out on it, and um, if you feel led to to support and you feel a little lucky, buy a ticket. You might win um, a, a wonderful experience here in Wyoming. And so that being said, I just want to thank you, Commission, for the opportunity to uh, serve Wyoming and all the good partners in this room. And uh, President, stand, stand for any questions. Chris, that was an excellent update. Um, I had a question. I didn't write it down, so it escapes me. I'll turn to the other commissioners while I try and think of mine. Any other commissioners have a question for Chris? I just wanted to say it's humbling to work with you guys. Everybody that's involved in this camp, I'm thinking of the thrills and watching it grow. It's a humbling experience for myself. New Deer Foundation. It's the things and the things that are right with this camp. What I think that's right with Wyoming and what just happened. This is really a need, and it's and it's it's, it's such a humbling experience to be a part of it. So I'd like to just make sure and thank everybody that puts all the time and effort into the betterment of wildlife. It's really gonna it's really gonna make a big difference. Thank you. Chris, on your I-89 camera project, do we have a total estimate on that? 
I have something in my mind, but I'm going to ask Dep Deputy Director Bruce to uh, address that, if you wouldn't mind, Deputy Director. I guess my question is, where are we with our federal grant and our grant, state grants on that? Yeah, um, President Brokaw, Commissioners, Director Nesvik, um, we met with YDOT a week ago Friday because the Infrastructure Act for $300 million, $350 million for wildlife crossings was recently released. So we met with them to talk about what was our strategy in our application. And we landed with Kimmer being our project that we're gonna apply for for this first round. There's approximately 111 million available. It's really the first two years out of the five years because they're late getting started, they combine the first two. So I say that because there'll be other years and other opportunities, but the first one um, we're gonna apply for Kimmer. We're gonna ask for approximately, as of today, um, 25 million. The grant awards they're predicting will be between half a million and 20 million. Um, we're gonna ask for 25 because we feel like we could get it. Um, we're going to use the general fund that was put into the lead, into the trust two years ago of $10 million. We're gonna match with that. We're gonna use about just over 6 million. It's a four to one match. And also the commission's um, 1.25 that you've already dedicated to the project as well as about a million that Chris and his team have fundraised so far. Um, the, the overall project cost right now kind of depends on who you ask. Um, our regional staff has been working with the district engineer from YDOT. They've done some preliminary work. I think the cost is up to 51 million in their preliminary work. Keep in mind that sort of eye in the sky. Like if they could do the ideal project, anything that possibly could be done, they're up to about 51. Um, we'll be scaling that back to what is needed and appropriate. Um, and that'll really fall into how many underpasses we do. There'll be one overpass for sure. I think you guys saw the site of that at the commission tour. And then the underpasses will be evaluating to where we can put the most effective, probably four to six, um, to get that in the ballpark around 38 million total cost. I think Chris will probably have a million by, I don't know, end of June, as hard as he's going. Well done. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Excellent. Any other commissioners have topics, Chris? Yeah. Um, and I don't know, Angie, this might be a question for you, but um, if you know uh, this whole project and its numerous underpasses and its funding, so is it the kind of project that can be broken up? Uh, and little pieces done at a time, or it does YDOT or you know, Department of Transportation federally want the whole thing done at once? Do you, do you know, even know yet? Mr. President, Commissioner, um, you could. You could always face these projects. Um, we're pretty dedicated to just doing the whole project at once. I think that's how we move things along faster and quicker because you know we have a whole list to go to. So we start piecemealing them, then we just never get to two and three, um, but you could hear, uh, especially depending on you know what that federal grant might be. Uh, will we get 25 million? I don't know. And so we definitely will continuously go back to the drawing board to, depending on how much funds we have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any other questions? Chris? Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, deviation from our published agenda. Uh, Mr. Corsi, would you like to come up and give us an update on your mule deer days we got to go to? Thank you, President Brokaw, members of the commission, Director Nesvik. I apologize, I was going to try to be here to kind of offer this up with the tail end of uh, Nisha's report, but uh, I committed to teaching science uh, classes at a middle school level, ecology and conservation of mule deer here in Casper. And then uh, as of Monday, I was asked, could you also, while you're here, could you talk to kindergartner and first graders about mule deer? And so I could tell you after getting that behind me this morning, uh, I, I was quite nervous this weekend about kindergarten and first grade, not, not so much with the seventh and eighth graders, but 
now that the experience is in my rear view mirror, I would, I would rather talk to kindergartner and first graders than anyone else throughout the rest of the day, I think. Their, their minds were just incredible in just their ability to be sponges and soak it in and ask crazy questions. Uh, I did think it was imperative, given this opportunity, knowing you won't be meeting until July again, uh, that I give you an overview of our recent Mule Deer Days event that you were a partner with us on. Uh, we were scheduled to close this event out on April 4th, but due to weather in Southwest Wyoming, that was moved to this past Tuesday, April 11th. And so I have not had a chance to sit down with Nish or Director Nesbik and go through this 16 page report but I think the overview of what is important to be able to take away from this event, despite as many of you know, uh, the weather inclement uh, adversities that that event was faced with, uh, March 10th and 11th, uh, when the dust was settled and all the, the I's were dotted and T's were crossed, that event will equate to $436,559.22. To mule deer specific conservation projects on the ground. So in our mind, the event was a, uh, a significant success. Uh, I have pages of documentation that we have solicited on feedback from vendors, from participants, uh, as well as um, what I thought was pretty telling in trying to mine out and flesh out the details of what impact the weather had. And uh, essentially, we had 382 folks, either through text messaging, emails, or social media, that had indicated that they were on their way and were met with road closures. So uh, I don't know how to quantify that to what percentage that impact had. Those are just the ones that we know through our outlets. But uh, the seminar aspect of it, I thought, uh, was very important. The youth aspect, extremely important. But overall, I think the event was something that we felt very good about and we'll continue to, with this event in the future. We have locked down the dates for next year's event to try to alleviate some of the risks of weather. Uh, it'll be May 3rd and 4th and we will continue to do it one more year in Rock Springs at Sweetwater County's events complex. Although there are some changes to the layout, uh, I think we'll be using another facility for the banquet and we'll have that entire exhibit hall um, for vendors. And the later we get into that year, Rock Springs has been host to the Rock Springs High School Finals Rodeo for years. And once that event gets later in the season, they have the ability to set up additional temporary structures that I think will pay dividends for us and being able to house what we need at that particular venue for one more year or so. With that, I would stand for any questions. I appreciate all of you being there too. Perfect. Uh, what is that number again? Four hundred and thirty-six thousand five hundred and fifty-nine dollars and twenty-two cents. What is it for? Yeah, so that that amount will be allocated to mule deer specific projects, and there's nine member. <laughs> yeah, there there is a nine member all volunteer project committee. If we can figure out how to get a scheduling to to get all of them together, uh, we just sent that poll out this past week. And trying to, to align nine different schedules, I, I think we'll, our, our hope is to at least put six in the room and have three be able to participate via virtually. But uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to see what the, this group can do. So. Mr. President. Yep, go ahead, sir. So Josh, I thought you did a great job. Um, I'm still not sure how in the world you guys had the, the event there and then turned it in like two hours and then hosted a banquet in the same room. It was. It was amazing. So you guys did a lot of work and, and to be commended on that. I'm not sure if you had 300 and yeah. 400 people that weren't able to make it, where they would have been, where they would have been seated in that room for the banquet, because it did seem like it was wall to wall people. Um, so anyway, good job on the event. Great job for conservation for mule deer. And so anyway, yeah, good job. Thank, thank you for that. Gosh, I, I thought it was a fantastic event. Uh, for the for the for the first first year, thought it went really well. Congratulations on running some black ink on it. But I was most surprised at the diversity of age in your seminars. And I think as an educational component, it's fantastic. That's really cool. Yeah, thank I, you. I really think you touched a lot of ground about some good conservation leaders. It was, it was excellent. I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, 
the, the just the gratitude of the event and the effort that went into it. I will tell you, we learned a lot from the event. Uh, you know, it didn't come with an owner's manual or a playbook. So we, you know, of these 16 pages, six of them are dedicated to what can be done differently, what can be done better. Uh, and I think that's where our focus is to identify those areas and move forward to, to mitigate them appropriately. So. I'm really proud, really glad that the department partnered with you guys and did that. And I'm anxious to see what other groups will come forward and do like, like events across the state, because I think that really targets some nice areas for some specific wildlife. So yeah, I job. agree. Absolutely excellent job. All right. Thank you. Okay. We're going to have a break. Correct. Is there anybody online? Any comments? I don't have any blue sheets. We're good there. We're going to stick right to the agenda. We're going to adjourn until 2.40. All right, we're ready to resume our general session of our commission meeting. Welcome back to Casper. Um, quick announcement real quick to my commissioners. Just got an email about the Wafa convention coming up in July. For our new commissioners, if you can go, please do so. It's, it's time well spent. So check your email for that. Registration's open. Get with Tony, she'll get you set up for that. Okay, our next agenda item is Dr. Dan Thompson and Brian DeBolt. They're gonna to talk to us about large pine worms. Thanks, President Brokaw, Director Nesbitt, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Dan Thompson. I think I've met all of you. Um, we are with the large carnivore section. This is a statewide section. And it is. And so we're going to kind of tag team this talk today. I'll begin and talk about some of the overarching things and monitoring that we do. I'll turn it over to Brian DeBolt, who is our conflict coordinator. He'll go over some of our conflicts. So this is kind of a year in the life of large carnivore section. And so um, it is long, but it's hard to condense a year of what we do in one hour, quite honest. I was told there's a delay. Okay, it is. Working. So uh, when, when we say large carnivores, uh, we're talking about black bears, grizzly bears, mountain lions, and wolves. Obviously, grizzly bears are still considered a federally threatened population. We're working on that, uh, but I'm gonna go over, we're gonna go over these four species today and some of the work done throughout the state by Game and Fish. So our role within Game and Fish is to maintain viable populations of these species on the landscape. We realize there's a lot of controversy that's inherent both on, or on both sides and everything in between. So there are a lot of public desires that are used in attitude when we, when we look at harvest for these species that we can hunt and those overall management uh, direction that we have. Management of conflicts is a pivotal component to maintaining large carnivores and carnivore conservation. And Brian DeBolt will talk to you about that. And at the, the foundation of all of this is information, outreach, and education. This is how we, uh, interact with our public and try to, to talk to them about these animals, because there is obviously also a human safety component when it comes to these species. Um, I alluded to this earlier, that uh, we never have to worry about apathy, which is a good thing when it comes to these, these animals. Uh, I would say it's more polarized when it comes to wolves, uh, but there, there's definitely a lot of interest right now. Of course, with the winter we've had, there's a lot of interest on predation and and these different species that we manage. Uh, I always have this slide um, that I like to throw in. Uh, that was at a meeting in Cuba a few years ago on Mount <laughs> Uh But it, it is interesting. Uh, Brian and I have been here for a while and have went through some ups and downs when it comes to these species on the landscape. Everything we do is very connected. Uh, you know, the, the information that we learn about conflict management plays into how we manage and, and conserve the species. Uh, the, the, the outreach and educational information is used to garner to garner what we can know to what we need to convey to the public and how we should manage these, these species. Our Bearwise Wyoming program, which I will talk about later today, again, is that foundation. It has state, local, national, and international reach, quite honestly, for the information we can put out there. It's very much a team approach throughout the game and fish. We have a large carnivore section. We work closely with all divisions, all regional personnel, 
for these species. That's a good idea. So, okay, I'm gonna go through the, how we monitor these four different species. And a lot of it is about evaluating trend, especially for mountain lions and black bears. We don't enumerate how many there are. We are changing that with black bears. We are, we are able to, to now systematically uh, calculate densities across the landscape. Uh, wolves and grizzly bears are currently more involved uh, as our efforts have shifted from recovery to management. And we've definitely, regardless of them being federally listed, we have recovered grizzly bears and we're in that conservation management phase on the ground. And it's important to, to realize and, and shouldn't come as a surprise, but these species are very different than our ungulate species. They're very different than deer, elk, or pronghorn. So we do manage them differently. So I'm gonna start with mountain lions. Mountain lions are the most cryptic of these species. And, and you know, it's funny, I've been studying mountain lions, not me, myself personally, but we've been studying mountain lions since the 60s and 70s when we first started putting collars on these animals. There's still no uh, gold standard other than going out and catching as many as you can to enumerate how many there are. But we are continually evaluating new tools to use in accordance with our harvest data to understand what's going on with mountain lion population. Those of you that were here last summer, uh, I believe we presented this slide. Now this is the last three years data. This is just a heat map of the level of, of mortality on the landscape. And when we include last year, so in certain areas like in the Wyoming range, we increased our harvest limits, we reached those. So we have this last winter actually had a very high level of harvest, which was actually good timing to coincide with the winter that we had. Uh, what's gonna be interesting is looking in uh, that, that Southern Bighorns, you guys are both looking both directions. So the Southern Bighorns in area 15 there. Um, as far as we can tell, that's the highest level of mortality ever documented for mountain lions. That's something we will continue to assess through time to, to look at it's hard to be causation, to be more correlative, but look at what that looks like with our deer herds on the landscape as well. And so I, that's something we're continually looking at to try to better understand that dynamic. And I wanna talk a bit about our monitoring. Uh, we've got some really very unique, interesting things that we've been doing within our section in the state. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but we started some of this work down in the, the Green River Rock Springs country. It was part of the Deer Elk Ecology Project through the university or the Hobbs School. Uh, Justin Clapp, who is our biologist, uh, came up with this, this program that I'm gonna show you where it's being used statewide and globally, but it's a really cool, amazing tool to analyze thousands and thousands of animal location points. It basically puts them into an algorithm, allows us to assess predation, allows us to assess movement, uh, it's just, the joke is, is when, when we was coming up with this, it was during the height of COVID. So the name was GP sec plus, and we don't really know how to say that. So that was, that was the only issue with the overall program. It's really hard to pronounce. So we haven't come up with a sexy term for it. Um, so again, the application is, is much bigger than specific to these mountain lines. It, it's, what it does is it clusters points on the landscape. So it allows us to look at parturition sites feeding sites, den rendezvous sites. It's being used in a lot of different species. Parturition can be used for migration stopover sites. Uh, the, the data management tools that were used to develop this are currently being used with all the, the deer data that we are collecting as an agency. Uh, the, 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 limitless pop, the limitless possibilities are, are really pretty interesting. And so this is the actual interface. And you can see this is moving. So this is Justin going through our data set. If any of you guys are experts in R, you'll understand it's perfect. I call it the matrix. So anyway, right now this has all the information contained in it. He's clicking on it. There, he just put up a, a particular mail from the Rock Springs country. Those are all those locations. You can zoom in on the points. It tells you the date, the time. The, the yellow circles are clusters. So then we go in and evaluate those. That allows us to tell what that animal is doing there. You can look at different uh, iterations of maps on there. If we can quantify what they're killing, what they're eating, or whether it was a bed site, you can quantify, and we're gonna switch to Casper here shortly. Again, you can zoom in on these. This, this tool, Justin created a way to actually download this every day. It sends it to computers, it sends it to your phone, so people can have a map right there. 
to go look at these. And these this, this similar algorithm is also being used again for some of this deer work. This is a one individual in the Casper region. A lot of points, obviously, all those different circles are clusters. And what we're going to zoom in on here is a dense site. We can see it's a higher cluster. Again, it's just a very unique tool that allows us to look, you know, back, back when I was doing this work, we didn't have the GPS technology. And so we didn't have to worry about this many points. Now we have, I see Director Nesbitt smiling at me for the age comment there, but, um, <laughs> but uh, we didn't have the, the ability to, to look at these fine scale information and to try to direct our information as far as what these animals are doing. Yes, sir. Um, can you go back? <laughs> Maybe. Well, yeah. Let me, let me just ask. Uh, you don't have to do this. An institutional ignorance is clustered. Mm -hmm. set, and I believe you said it's going to value of that. Correct. Can you go give me just a minute or two on what you mean by that? Sure. So, yeah, and again, I, this is the Cliff Notes version by far. So this was ran through multiple models to predict predation. And so we'll get a download to say whether we feel it's a kill or not. And so anything that we feel is a kill or a predation event, we go in and evaluate that. And so by that, we'll go in to see, and then if we find that animal, we try to determine was it killed or scavenged. We see a high level of scavenging. In fact, this winter, we're seeing a lot of scavenging. Uh, with some of the work we're doing. We've underestimated scavenging in the past. We see as high as 20%. So that's some of the, by evaluate, going into these sites and determining, is it a kill and what is it? We had a, an animal that was subsisting on raccoons, Canada geese, and porcupines. So it's not, it's not a standard as just killing one deer a week. We have males that are killing a lot more elk. We have a, a very different suite of, of things that they're actually feeding on. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. And again, I mentioned that this, the data management skills that are, are, are being used in, in many applications within the state, but just this specific cluster algorithm, I already mentioned Rock Springs and Casper for mountain lions. It's also being used in Yellowstone on two different areas for mountain lions. We've got uh, wolf, Clusters looking at predation both in the Cody region and in the Jackson region through University of California, Berkeley. We've also used it internally to look at wolf den rendezvous sites. Grand Teton National Park has used it to look at fine scale date location data for red fox, and it will be implemented. Dr. Joe Holbrook is going to be using it on swift fox. And that's just in Wyoming. And again, these aren't all of the ones that, these are the ones that have contacted Justin to, to use this, this tool. Uh, it's being used in Patagonia and in the Pacific Northwest on mountain lions. It's also being used on wolves in the Great Lakes in Canada. Eurasian lynx throughout Europe, Eurasian lynx are basically their mountain lions over there. They have a, a similar predation strategy over there. I'm going to try to use quicker. House cats, the, the world's worst predator. Uh, African wild dogs, Indian tigers. Whoop, I forgot about ravens. And even some sea turtle work. And that's just from in the last year, these people go. It's, it's really cool to be part of something that, that within our section, within the game and fish, that we're, we're trying to help people globally learn about wildlife species. And we've talked about it with this you about this before. One thing that we just wrapped up very recently with the collars is the investigation of the role of predation in CWD management. We're very excited to see how that comes out. I really, we don't have any preliminary information for you, but we will be presenting that to you once we are done. Uh, it's been very interesting to try to look at it from the predator standpoint and being able to gain as many samples from dead deer as we are that we're asking hunters to bring in. It, it's a very, and that's part of that investigation that you that you taught up. We were actually were going in and pulling CWD samples from deer that were killed by mountain lions to, to evaluate that prevalence. Mm, not my favorite. Um, 
again, and so again, we 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 find our habitat map. We presented this information to you. Uh, understanding these predator prey relationships are very important. We really understand that. And again, we've we've actually worked with the commission, with our regions, and with the public to increase a lot of harvest opportunity for mountain lions throughout the state. For wolves, I'm, I'm going to not talk as in depth about wolves because Ken will be here soon to, to talk about season setting for that. But again, uh, 2022 was the 21st consecutive year that we have exceeded all recovery criteria for wolves in Wyoming. And again, we annually develop those harvest regulations and we will be meeting before you in July to set our proposed commission to bring our proposed uh, um, harvest regulations to you. We're harvesting right around 30 wolves annually in the state, in the trophy game area. And uh, currently the Fish and Wildlife Service is conducting a status review. And uh, again, you know, I, I think what we've really seen is believe it or not, a, a more of a normalized approach moving forward for wolves. And we do mark a lot of wolves and um, it's actually been very beneficial. There's a lot of things going on in surrounding states right now. There's a lot of interest in wolves from many different viewpoints and having the ability to have most of our packs with collars in them so we can actually enumerate how many wolves we have is very beneficial when we get up to set what our harvest limits are going to be. And again, it gives us fine scale movements, allows us to assess survival mortality, disease management. And when we come and talk to you, you know, we're talking more about a minimum estimate for the area. Allows us to look at pack size and pack dynamics. Again, um, we, we see the area for suitable wolf habitat is full. And we're managing just below that area. Um, I know there's some interest in here in some of the Grovant area where we've directed a lot of harvest there. Um, and so that will come up. I think we have some numbers from the public that are gonna be talking about that. But again, it's, it's very handy to have these numbers that we will bring in front of you in, in July. And again, we call our 30 wolf, just over 30 wolves in the trophy game area. Again, outside the trophy game area, we do not have management authority for wolves. And what, I mean, the, the important part is we're managing for an objective of approximately 160 wolves in that trophy game area, which equates to around 300 wolves in the state. So for the people that are against wolf hunting, we're not managing to the bare minimum but we're not also managing for, for an extraordinary amount that would not be beneficial for wolves even. So that we're maintaining that objective around 160 wolves. And, and what's important is that we've, we've stabilized the population and we've been able to really reduce that, the conflict potential when it comes to cattle and less wolves having to be killed for depredating cattle. And that's very important. And again, I've already, I've already stressed this, uh, the accurate estimates allow that for a more refined approach when we come to this. I mean, the, le the level of data we have for wolves is very beneficial to have harvest limits that are fairly irrefutable when we go to the public. Because we have national and international scrutiny on what we do, and we have a lot of interest in wolves currently to the south, north, and west of us. Uh, that fine scale movement also allows us to look at those interactions and uh, being and collaborating with others to, to assess predation and things like that as well. Hey, Dan, so yes. just, I'm, I'm gonna um, toot your horn for you for a minute. So one of the things, Dan, is oftentimes humble about some of these things, but, you know, back when we first had wolves delisted, the, the um, experts that we have in our large carnivore section said, you know, we can make, they made a lot of predictions. They used good science to make those predictions. And they said, if we do this, this will be the outcome. And that has played out year to year to year. And um, now we're at five years of, of delisted wolves and what they predicted would happen and the level of mortality that could be withstood to still keep wolves above um, recovery criteria has, has played out perfectly. And so they've done just an exceptional job and, and others have picked up on that. Thank you, appreciate that. Hope you didn't jinx us. No. <laughs> now, luckily we don't have to worry about superstition with when you have data. Um, so for black bear monitoring, we were just in front of you in, in January to talk about black bear uh, harvest seasons. And again, what we see is a very growing interest by sportsmen and women in the state to hunt black bears. We've responded by a very requisite increase in harvest opportunity. We've increased harvest limits across the board through time. And we've also tried to further quantify what's going on with our black bears. And so we use this hair snare DNA approach systematically across the state. And I've talked to you about this already, but it allows us to 
our still main metric is looking at the harvest data that, that we obtain and to assess what's going on with the population trend through time. But this allows us to use that harvest data, but also go in and, and actually calculate what a density is in a bear management unit. And basically we have a hanging blood lure in the middle of this barbed wire corral, the bear walks in, leaves a little sample for us and we go back in and collect those. And then that gives us, that allows us to actually calculate a density in, in these different areas. And the Grays River was the first area we did it. Bighorns, more recently, we will have uh, numbers for the Laramie Range, some of your country there in the, in the Southeast part of the state. And we, obviously we're never gonna have the densities that you see in the Eastern part of the US. But, but what we can see is we used that density in Sierra Madres to further justify increasing harvest limits. And, uh, we still maintain a high level of harvest in that Wyoming range with the lower density of bears, but it really helps us to, to have a little bit more information behind what we're doing. And we are partnering up with, uh, again, with the University of Wyoming, the Hobbs School, uh, the, the young woman in the picture before with the black bears doing her master's there, looking at different things when it comes to black bears that, with all this data that we're collecting. Uh, an interesting thing we're looking at is, is the relationship with bait sites and black bear movement in and among baits. And again, I already stressed this, but these density estimates are used in coordination with our harvest data to set these harvest limits. And again, we're, we're proponents of these mandatory checks with field personnel. I met with a Wyoming Outfitters and Guides Association recently to talk about rectifying some issues we had internally with that. Uh, moving forward, we're going to be doing that. The systematic approach is something that we're gonna continue into the future. And so in a few years, we'll be going back to the Grays River and then looking through time. And it's got to, you, you got to look long term on these things. And we're excited to be looking at some of this use of bait sites by black bears. Uh, we just recently got a very favorable court opinion to allow for the continued use of, of bait sites on Forest Service lands, which was in question. And now moving on to grizzly bears. Now, of course, we are uh, we are not. We do not have management authority for grizzly bears, but honestly, we do the majority of work on GYE grizzly bears and have since the 1970s. And we've shifted from this preservation to recovery to a conservation phase that we're at now. Uh, we've been delisted twice. And um, again, we're, we're very committed to what we do with grizzly bears. One thing that we do is may try to maintain, oh, sorry, um, I'm gonna, I have these up here because you'll hear me say this term DMA fairly often, the black line. That is what's considered the biologically and socially suitable habitat for grizzly bears for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Now, the original recovery zone is the red line, and they've been beyond that for many decades. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go through some different slides with some, with some of these boundaries at hand. And we just recently calculated the grizzly bear distribution for 2022. It's right about the same as it was in 2020. It's so the first year we haven't seen a continued increase, which is which we would expect. They've already occupied all the suitable habitat. As they expand further, there's a higher conflict potential, which Brian's going to talk about. Uh, again, we've talked about this before, but uh, the, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem Grizzly Bear is a true conservation success story. We would like to move the ball forward on that, of course. But you know, this, this long-term data set allows us to, to really to go back and talk about some things that, that, we, that other people don't have that fortune to talk about. It's all about maintaining representative sample of grizzly bears. And then again, we've actually actively been doing this since the seventies and some people get frustrated with us capturing a handling bear. It's not, we don't do that for fun. We do it, we, when we catch the minimum number we need to to maintain that representative sample. And every bear that we catch provides insight to that overall population. We pull hair that gives us insight into diet. We do bioimpedance on them that gives us insight into body fat. Everything that we do allows us to better understand what's going on for grizzly bears so we can stand in front of anybody in the world that asks us if they're recovered and say yes. And this past year uh, was very interesting when the floods came in that shut down uh, Yellowstone. We had traps set in the Crandall area, northwest of Cody. and this was from someone from the highway. As our personnel walked in on foot to check a trap that had a grizzly bear in it that had to release it with a rope for their own safety. Um, and so we were proud that we, we kept working despite the floods and everything going on. And last summer we did capture 13 grizzly bears for monitoring purposes, including uh, six females, four new adult females in an area that we've trapped for decades. 
And this is something some of you have seen if it works. Um, the summer of 2021 was the first time that we've implemented aerial capture of grizzly bears in the lower 48. It wasn't that choppy on the ground, actually. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that was that was our mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom moment, I guess. But if you will, we caught 10, 10 grizzly bears in seven and a half hours in backcountry settings that would have cost, took us a decade to do horseback. So from an efficiency standpoint, it's a game changer. It's not something we'd ever do every year, but uh, it's something to have as a tool really changes what we were able to do. And again, that monitoring informs management. This long-term data set has allowed us to refine and have more accurate estimates. For the longest time we had, we knew we had a conservative estimate. We were talking six to 700 bears, knowing that we were well under that. Now we're talking about more than a thousand based on the same data we're collecting because we have a more accurate model that we're using an integration, integrated population model. It's the same model or similar model that's being used for a lot of different ungulates here and elsewhere in the Western North America. And it gives, it also gives the ability to have projections and predictability. You can separate out uh, our sex and age cohorts. So in the future, if we're, if we have harvest, we can, we're going to be separating by adult males and adult females. We can look at what's going on with the population. And then another thing that we did recently, uh, we, we met with you a year ago and we, conti we continued some work that we had done in a different area to look at yearling uh, depredation. And so um, this was asked to be presented. So in 2022, we, we continued some, or we initiated some, dep some work, excuse me, uh, monitoring, looking at yearling depredation because we didn't really have a lot of information on what type of a multiplier comes into play when it comes to yearlings. We have decades of, of information on calf multipliers. But so we went forth this past summer, Clint Atkinson, who whose work you, you've already seen, we went across four ranches, marked 345 yearlings across these four separate ranches, three of which occurred within this grazing complex. One was to the west of the upper green grazing complex. What you see is 25 to 50% of the group is, is unheard of when we come to wildlife population studies, if, if you have that high level. So the numbers that we're presenting are very representative of what's happening on the landscape. What we do see is a lower level of depredation on yearlings than we, than we see with calves as expected. That does not take away from the localized impact that that can have. We did not document any wolf depredation on these yearlings and that was similar to what was found in Cody as well. I have a very busy, um, so I, we, we've walked through this before and basically what we do is we, we go out, we have a very great working relationship with those producers where they understand that if we have a marked animal that dies that we know of, we're not going to tell them that and vice versa. They're, they're, they're going to tell us about any animal that, that dies because we're going to investigate it. But this allows us to have these marked animals that die, gives us a way to have a detection rate, which is then used to calculate what multiplier would take to compensate for that. And you'll remember when Albert Summers came in front of the commission a year ago, yeah. He said, it'd probably be about one and a quarter to one for us. And uh, not to toot his horn, but he was, was 1.28 to one is what they found in the upper green, specific to those grazing allotments. When you include one to the outside, it's 1.79. So our, our, our current multiplier is very indicative of what we're seeing out there. It ranges from a one to one ratio to higher, uh, but um, I, we hadn't presented to this to you before. So we wanted to make sure you had that in front of you. Yeah, and for the benefit of the, um the two new commissioners. So when this came before the commission a year ago, um, the commission asked the department to go put this together. And so now they've, they've done that. They had a field season to work on it and they're just bringing this back to you. I think that um, there's, you know, there could be questions as to whether from some of the um, livestock producers as to whether the commission should change the, the current uh, 1.25 to one um, ratio that we pay on damage claims. And so uh, this, this is the information you asked for and um, something that you consider as you evaluate that. And again, what that data allows us to do is do document things like the increasing distribution of grizzly bears. Many of you have seen this slide before, uh, but what we've really seen through time is an expansion across the board, especially on that Eastern front 
the point where we filled up the suitable habitat and have spilled out beyond that. Our 2022 map is not up there, but it's fairly similar with some expansion up the Graybull River to the east. Mr. President, one more thing here. So Dan has said this, but it sometimes um, gets looked over. So if you want to go back, yep. Dan. So when Dan talks about the population estimate, he's talking about um, the bears within that blue line, the, de the demographic monitoring area. There are bears um, outside of that, as you can see, the green shaded area represents occupied grizzly bear habitat. Stuff inside the blue line is occupied habitat, but it's, it's designated as suitable. Both, both biologically and socially. So when Dan talks about a thousand bears, it's actually more than that if you count everything outside the blue line. But we don't monitor out there. We don't invest a lot of time. We basically are, um, the, the time we spend there is dealing with conflict. Correct. And so the population estimate doesn't apply to those bears. And it's also important to note that, uh, that when that was brought up too, there was an accusation that we were looking harder. This was a decade ago now. Uh, we were looking harder. That's why the population was increasing, which is false. And also, there's a higher higher level of mortality outside that DMA. And that, those mortalities that count that are outside the DNA, DMA do not count against those mortality thresholds within the DMA. It's a common sense approach, actually. Yes, sir. Um, so you look at the map and the expansion of the, the train. When does it not become greater Yellowstone expansion? When does it expand so much that it's not a greater Yellowstone? I gotta go back. Yeah. So there, that, ah. Don't laugh at me, Wayne. Wayne warned me about this. Okay, so the, this blue line is the distinct population segment boundary. So if a grizzly bear makes it down here, it's now not, it's not considered part of the GYE. If it goes to the north, it's going to be connecting to the NCDE. Does that make sense? So your camera bear was like 30 miles from the edge, I think it was, from the DMA bound. I was just curious on, you know, when to something different. So yeah, if, if a bear gets to this area, it's considered fully endangered. Um, and then as they go north and to the west, then there's other, pop, the NCDE is up here and they're almost together. And then you have some other cell wave, bitter cell kirk to the south, northwest, yes. Mr. President, just to be very clear, so the area in the black line is where we believe we should be managing for grizzly bear occupancy. The line, the area between the black line and the dark blue line, Dan just described the DPS. Even though it's in the greater Yellowstone, we do not believe it's in the best interest of grizzly bears or people to manage for grizzly bear occupancy in between the black and the blue line. So in other words, we don't, we would not look favorably on a grizzly bear making its way to the big one. That Correct. would be something we would be advocating for um, removing immediately. It's something we don't promote because it's not good for the long-term viability of bears. Either. Those bears do not have a long, they have a much higher conflict potential and there's a less tolerance for those out there, which is understandable. All right. Okay. Oh, I skipped that. Well, there's my joke slide. Um, <laughs> so what we've seen again is that, as Director Nezik was talking about, we've got about a third of our bear occupied habitat is outside suitable habitat. The, the area outside the DMA is, is equivalent to the state of the, the, the ground size of New Jersey the state. And so again, what we see is a higher conflict potential and increased use of private lands. And so again, the number's about the same for 2022. Again, everybody gets focused on the, the national park system, which, we, which was huge in the beginning. When it came to, that's where the grizzly bears still were. But we're talking about the occupied area of grizzly bears, private land is more than Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and JDR combined right now. 
And so what does that mean? That means increased conflict potential. Turn over to Mr. Polk. Okay. Director Nesvik and uh, President, members of the commission, I appreciate you letting us come and visit with you today. Um, I am gonna talk about yeah, the conflicts that we deal with with all these species. Uh, again, Brian DeBolt is my name. I'm a large carnivore conflict coordinator at Lander. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, as all the bears that we're talking about and um, specifically grizzly bears, um, in addition to, you know, the, the abundance of mountain lions and black bears and other large carnivores that we classify as trophy game in the state of Wyoming, with their populations being what they are, we definitely have a tremendous amount of potential for conflict. So, oh, that was Dan's last little. Um, even walking through the town of Jackson, we have family groups of grizzly bears, so. Um, yeah, and this does take, uh, kind of takes an army. I mean, we definitely want to thank, you know, our local wardens and biologists, but but especially like, you know, Luke Ellsbury and Clint Atkinson and uh, Phil Quick and Mike Boyce, um, Scott Stingley. They're the ones on the ground doing this conflict work. And uh, I really have to mention they're um, on call 24 seven, ready to, to tackle whatever task comes at them. So again, with any of these four species, grizzly bears, black bears, mountain lions, and wolves, where they are classified as trophy game. Again, uh, not in the, in the predator zone with wolves. So what is a conflict? That's often, I believe, a confusing topic for some folks. And uh, it, bottom line is it's, it's bona fide damage. You know, one of these critters has to actually cause some sort of of conflict that results in property damage or gets a food reward, okay? And uh, otherwise it's not a conflict. So um, we do manage these conflicts because, yeah, it promotes support for the department. You know, the worst thing you wanna hear is, hey, I called the game and fish and nobody showed up. Well, we hope that never happens. Um, we, we gotta at least show up and see what's going on. For one, to verify is it actually a conflict? And if it is, let's help this individual deal with whatever we have to deal with. Um, and especially if it's a human safety issue, you know, that, that's paramount to us to deal with that. So when I talk about the data, these are the minimum verified bona fide conflicts that, that we respond to. Yes, sir, Mr. Masterson. Uh, the, uh, did you mention uh, food reward is considered a conflict? I did. So, and food reward is even defined a little bit further as uh, it's a human food reward and a, a anthropogenic food reward is what we term it. So some food that's associated specifically with people, whether it's garbage or bird seed or pet food, livestock grain, that type of stuff. Um, that's considered a conflict. That's considered a conflict okay. if a bear gets that. Yes, sir. Thank you. So um, just some examples. So on the left, a bear trotting down some urban road in the middle of the night, not a conflict. That's just a sighting or an encounter. On the other hand, a grizzly bear rips out the back of a grain shed and eats about 100 pounds of sweet feed. That's a conflict, okay? The bottom right, okay? A torn up hammock. You know, again, at, at um, first sight, you may say, well, I just kind of tore up a hammock. I mean, it is some property damage, but is that really a conflict? Well, when we look at the circumstances surrounding that conflict, um, we got a little video here, and uh, sorry, it's a little choppy. Hey, bear. But basically this, it's a smaller black bear, I'll admit, but she knocked the guy out of his hammock first thing in the morning, and then she proceeded to, you know, destroy the hammock, basically maul the hammock, and you'll see where she gets his sleeping bag and she really gets aggressive with that. Like, unfortunately, it's a little choppy, but um, she really throws that thing around. And, you know, it's full of human scent. It's in an occupied campground. There's lots of tents, campers, different Sleep things around. Bag. That is predacious behavior by every, every definition of the word. That's not good. Then, not only does the bear ignore 
uh, yeah, the yeah. guy who's filming it, it, that was him that got knocked out of the hammock. Yeah, like someone um, his yells, the bear then proceeds to walk over to another occupied tent, stick his nose in it, and the gal inside was kind of aware of what was going on and punches the bear in the nose when he sticks his nose right there. That's the end of the video. <clears throat> so, on record, we have a bear that uh, tore up a hammock and exhibited some, you know, potentially, uh, you know, food conditioned, even though we never documented where this bear got its food. Um, definitely food condition habituated, potentially dangerous behavior. And we closed the campground and yeah, we removed that bear, absolutely. And on paper, you know, we could get criticized for that. <laughs> you, you killed a bear for tearing up a hammock? Well, again, you gotta put it into perspective. That's why we investigate these things. You know, we have professionals that are, that are looking at the background of this and, and, and putting them into the category that it properly belongs in. And that, that's, a, that's a conflict. And the proper resolution to that is, is to remove that bear before it injures or kills somebody, for sure. So conflicts overall throughout these four species, um, again, are dominated by grizzly bear. Um, grizzly bears are big, bold critters, and they create a lot of conflict. So on down the line there, you know, a handful of mountain lion conflicts, and I'll talk about these just a little bit more in detail. So mountain lion conflict specifically, most of them are mountain lions killing sheep. Um, you know, we'll have them kill a, a pet, you know, dog or a guard animal occasionally. Um, and uh, of course, chickens and that type of stuff. And so what did we do in response? You know, we removed 11 mountain lions last year. And when we talk about removals of any of these animals, it, it's either a lethal removal or a live removal. And in this case, um, we did have four orphan kittens that just set up shop under somebody's porch. And uh, it was, you know, sounds easier than it was, but it, um, it took some doing by Clint to get them all caught, um, but he got them all rounded up and their chance of survival in the wild is really zero. And so, you know, the best time, uh, thing to do in that case, they, there was a willing zoo that was capable of taking them. So they were relocated, but they're called a removal because they're removed from our population animals, for sure. So. Wolf conflicts, of course, extremely dominated by, by killing cattle. That's what they do, kill a handful of sheep. And we did have one weanling horse killed this year. And as a result of that, within the, again, the where they're classified as trophy game, um, as agency removal was, was 10 wolves this year in 22 some. Black bear conflicts. Um, so we start expanding the numbers and types of conflict we're dealing with when we get to bears, of course, because wolves and lions, you know, are, you know, pretty specifically carnivorous, but black bears are omnivorous. And so whatever drives their stomach that day, whatever type of food source they're looking for, maybe dictates what type of conflict they, they get involved in. And most of our black bear conflicts absolutely are garbage. You know, and then things associated with, with things around houses and developed areas, you know, pet, food, livestock food, bird seed, and then they do cause a lot of property damage, barbecue grills, that type of stuff, and on down the line there. So grizzly bear conflicts, again, they are dominated by um, when grizzly bears kill cattle. And part of that has to do with, if you see, you know, like what Dan talked about, um, we're seeing this expansion of grizzly bears into places um, where they just haven't been in recent history. Lands that are occupied, um, you know, dominated by human use activities. And we've done, and the people of the state of Wyoming that live and work with grizzly bears have done a wonderful job of securing attractants, minimizing conflicts, all those type of things within the core. But as those bears expand out into those other areas, you know, um, one thing that's really hard to prevent is livestock depredation. And so that, that dominates, you know, the number of conflicts that we see on an annual basis. In the same realm of that expanding into private lands and outside of the DMA, where we're seeing these conflicts, um, which again is outside of 
suitable habitat for bears. It's just not wise to, to promote the long-term existence of these potentially dangerous large carnivores in a lot of those areas. So um, at management actions associated with these conflicts, we removed 15 bears and relocated six bears, which is honestly, um, I can't explain exactly why, I'll talk about it in a sec, but um, what drives conflict numbers for sure. Um, but uh, last year was one of our lowest conflict years for sure. Can't put a exact, you know, there's no silver bullet to say why, but that was a, you know, if we could have years every year like we did last year, um, we'd take it. Yeah, no human injuries and, you know, minor human injuries, but um, yeah, definitely no human death and a minimized number of conflicts was good. So, um, so yeah. Again, you can see we're starting to see a shift and it's all a result of where these bears are causing conflict and what our population modeling is telling us what's going on. You know, we're definitely removing a few more bears on an annual basis than we actually relocate. And again, a lot of that just occurred on private land, you know, um, goes without saying with, um, yeah, what is it that drives conflict numbers? So if a bear's getting into garbage or getting these anthropogenic food rewards uh, that Commissioner Masterson brought up, um, that's definitely a result of, of maybe the seasonal um, abundance or lack of natural foods that are available on the landscape. But when it comes to why bears are killing livestock, there's no direct correlation there. It's harder to predict. Sometimes bears just, have a heyday and really key in on livestock and start killing them and other years they don't. And it's, and it's kind of irrelevant to the abundance of natural foods that are out there. One thing that we're starting to see in a shift too is um, again, uh, conflict, at least calls of conflict or um, a perception of, you know, the social tolerance that's going on out there. You know, I'm not a big Facebook or Twitter or social media person, but um, we're being subject to that quite a bit. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but that's why we investigate those things too, because somebody's perceived perception of a conflict may or may not be. So our conflict program, you know, that uh, um, it has a field response program starts out first of all, with trying to prevent uh, these conflicts from occurring in the first place by either informing people, educating them or, or securing of attractants. And if that doesn't work, we shift gears and uh, managing individual animals. So one thing we did this year, for example, was you know we, we string miles of electric fence to keep bears out specifically. And this one in particular is uh, around an apiary, you know, these beehives that were getting by, hit by grizzly bears. Um, we do it all the time. And you can see our um, fellow Ray Hageman here, our videographer for the department is, um, he says, hey, let's let's kind of do a little how-to video while you're out there building it, actually doing it. So, yeah, he came along and filmed it. And, uh, you know, that is now currently available on our website on the Game of Fish. Pretty cool. One way to, yeah, maybe put up the electric fence and, and keep bears at it, whatever attractant it is, whether it's a grain shed or beehives or garbage cans. So, Fladry, that's another one. This is... Um, if you're not familiar with that, yeah, this is called fladry. And in a very small pasture type situation, it, we've had seen some relative success. It keeps wolves out, okay? For some reason, they just don't like those 18 inch flags hanging off there. So, um, but they eventually do get habituated to it. And this is actually what they call turbo fladry. So it's electric, okay? It's electrified. And uh, anyway, just another thing we do to try to prevent conflict. Um, we've worked with a lot of groups, the American Bear Foundation specifically, Safari Club International Foundation, given bear spray, free bear spray to folks if they come and show up. And we've turned it into quite a deal um, where basically they have to go through at least kind of a mini little five minute, if nothing else, little education course about bear safety and different things um, before they get their free can of bear spray. We're not just tossing it at them and letting them go down the street. So a uh, big education component there. Um, but it's what's real neat in the recent past, we've had, you know, we gave away, um, you know, about 500 cans last year. This year, we've already given away 
300 cans. And we plan on giving away 300 more this fall. But yeah, like I said, a good thing about that, at least in the Lander region, we had fish folks, habitat folks uh, from the Game of Fish employees department folks show up. And while everybody's standing in line, you know, waiting for their free stuff, they can visit with them, talk to them about whatever, winter conditions, where are you stocking fish, all these things. So it, it's become a, a, a big thing for us. So really good success there. Another, again, uh, preventative thing that we do, we work with landowners, property owners. This is a bear proof, you know, trash dumpster. They can haul it to the, to the dump in town because it's not close by. Um, definitely prevented a lot of conflicts right there. Um, I don't know how many bears I've myself seen climb off that hill and into the dumpster that used to sit there, uh, but they don't anymore. So that's really nice. Um, another thing we're seeing, um, you know, is the potential for some dangerous human interactions, specifically on the roadways. And this isn't overly new. I think this picture is probably eight years old. You know, we've been putting up these signs up on, this one's on Togety Pass. Um, you know, hey, caution, there's bears on the road, you know, try to stay away. And um, people are getting too close. We're starting to see some potentially dangerous interactions. Um, and, but they still stop. Okay, people still stop. And so um, this isn't a new law or something that we came up with. We just changed the sign that said, hey, it's unlawful to actually stop on the road. You can't, it's a controlled access highway. You can't stop here, okay? Uh, maybe that'll stop, okay? So we actually have a task force. It's the Wyoming Department of Transportation, the Highway Patrol, US Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Game and Fish, Forest Service, if I forgot to mention them, all involved in, okay, how are we going to try to control people uh, so something bad doesn't happen? You know, it's great that we have the opportunity to view wildlife, um, whether it's a moose or a grizzly bear, you know, from our roads, uh, just going through our forests. That's, that's pretty great. But, but we have to be good stewards of that. So um, it's just, uh, it's getting too close. You know, um, we got a little bit of... Um, I guess some comments that said, hey, I mean, don't be threatening to, yeah, maybe write somebody a ticket, you know, if they're stopping on the road. But this is what we're seeing. And this isn't good. You know, this bear's too close to people. And, you know, the potential for her to get struck by a vehicle and, and everything else that's going on up there is really high. So um, we continue to manage people the best we can. We put little signs out. We try to slow them down. We move those signs literally daily you know, try to get in front of people. And um, this is, um, yeah, put up more signs, bigger signs, you know, stay in your vehicle. I mean, don't even get up, please stay in your vehicle. And then this is what we see. Almost on a daily basis up there. Now, apparently, I, I don't know much about cameras, but apparently those three foot lenses, you need to get closer than that to get a good picture, I guess. And you have to keep walking to get ahead of them. And, you know, I mean, this bear seems relatively tall. I don't know if you saw, she's got a little bitty cub with her. But at any point that she decides she's had enough, there ain't a single one of those individuals that could get away from her in time. So, and again, you also saw traffic going by. Um, it's, it's high speed, you know, it's a, it's a highway. Um, and there's a lot of commercial traffic, big trucks. So we realized we can't, we can't control the people. There, there's going to continue to be what I call unethical wildlife viewing that's going to continue to happen. And we don't want somebody to get hurt or, you know, a bear to get killed. And uh, so we said, well, let's try to manage the bear a little more. So we shift gears, you know, shoot these little firecrackers at them and maybe a little more aggressive, even some rubber slugs, that type of stuff. Um, and we received quite a bit of criticism for that, you know, petition, uh, you know, let the bears be. <laughs> Don't do this to them. And, uh, you know, we are trying to let them be, you know. And so my philosophy is you leave them alone, we'll leave them alone. Okay. Um, yeah. The bears are far easier to control than some of the people. Most people are really good. You bet. No, great question. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, um, enough of the roadside stuff. So, Here's an example of a, 
Um, this is an area where we had lots of conflict, typical just ranch setting, you know, but it's right in the middle of, of bear and wolf and even lion habitat. We've had all kinds of conflicts here. And so we work with this landowner and basically build a Fort Knox of fences around his place. And, um, you know, he's got some sheep and some llamas and a handful of cattle and, and poultry, of course, zero conflicts since we've went in and, and done all this work to fence everything off. So, so it's possible, it's possible, but it does take a lot of work. Um, our damage compensation program, as Dan mentioned, you know, it's monetary compensation um, for animals that are verified as killed and uh, for a lot of missing livestock that are presumed to have been killed above and beyond what we actually verify. And I say verified damage only. I'll give you an example of that. Just like what's a conflict, what's not. Well, this calf on the left, okay, four days old and... Uh, in the calving pasture, definitely wolf sign around, not much because it's pretty grassy, um, but typical wolf feeding behavior consumed almost entirely within a number of hours. And it did have bite marks, um, you know, behind the front leg, the back legs are obviously gone, behind the front legs and on the throat where it's typical of, you know, wolf depredation. The one on the right, so more likely than not, that calf on the left was killed by wolves, absolutely. They get verified payment for that. The one on the right, you know, no. That's, to me, obviously, <laughs> uh, barbed wire, something else this horse got caught in. Um, more than likely, it is not caused by a trophy game animal. So we don't pay for something like that. But that's why we investigate them. That's why we look at every single one to determine uh, where that goes. So when all these other options that we do and, and working with the landowners and different things, um, we, we still have conflicts. Like say, where, where these animals and, and uh, people coexist, you're gonna have conflicts. So we may have to attempt to capture the animal. Um, we do try to relocate them, you know, if that's an option, but some animals definitely have to be removed from the population. So, Another thing that we do have to deal with, with these large, again, potentially dangerous predators on the landscape is we have a predator attack team in place. We have a lot of, you know, folks that have been trained uh, in this regard throughout the department. Um, when, when a predator like this, a large carnivore injures or kills somebody, um, and we have to determine the appropriate control action as a result of that. We got to do a thorough investigation as to the cause, um, you know, of the attack. And, and again, to determine what the appropriate control action is. So it's a big team approach, lots of training involved in that. Um, and we take it very seriously. So um, that's a whole nother presentation in and of itself. But um, so I kind of look at, at this whole social media thing. I mentioned this earlier. I, I saw this cartoon and I just thought it was so applicable. You know, it's got an empty grave for Bear 399. You know, she's ready because she's habituated to humans, I guess, for the grave. And, and all the photographers trying to get close. Again, the unethical photographers, not all, um, just that group in the picture. And they're feeding them. We've definitely documented, you know, illegal feeding activity and approaching and different things. So, and it's got chronic wasting disease in there and elk feeding and everything else. So it was kind of a, um, I thought a representative slide of everything, but there's definitely a false perception of state management out there. What we do on the ground is way different than what is out on social media typically. So, Humans are loving these animal, animals to death, quite literally. Um, and we're stuck in the middle trying to, you know, yeah, be in this conservation phase. So I think that's about, yeah, that's all I got for you. Let me do questions now if they have any. Mr. President? Sure. Sure, we can do some questions. Commissioner, any questions? Thank you. Just gonna end here with, oh, sorry, Lance. Just wrap up with our Bear Wise Wyoming program at the end. Sorry.
So again, I've already alluded to this, you know, this Bear Wise Wyoming program, it's not just specific to bears. So we do a lot of outreach on all these large carnivores. But as, as Brian mentioned, you know, the majority of our conflicts are with grizzly bears. And when it comes to human safety, that's a, our, our bigger issue. So there's a lot of work on this program and it's actually a template for a lot of other agencies as well. And just as a reminder, it's not a new concept. There we go. Um, so recently there was a, a notion of creating a bear smart program for a lot of places. And, and they were talking to people and more specific to Jackson that we should do this. And we had to remind people that the bear wise program was started uh, in the earlier 2000s and in, in Jackson, so one of the areas. So again, it's something we've been around for a while, which is good because we've been able to learn from our mistakes and build from that. And again, just last year, Brian talked about the, the fencing. It, it's such a good program to be able to, to put up some more permanent electric fences around these gardens. And like everyone's a chicken farmer now, um, and there's, it's not the chickens as much as the, the, the feed for them. Um, we actually, Brian already talked about this. We've got a video, I'm gonna skip over it. Um, that please go to the website if you're interested, any members of the public, how to properly put up an electric fence. Because just like anything else, you got to do it right, or it's not going to do any good. Um, we do have a new bear trailer that we're currently in the process of stocking, uh, purchased by Safari Club International and American Bear Foundation. Uh, it has this charging bear that's on ATV wheels that we will bring at some point and show you. It's really cool. The kids love it. Adults love it. Goes about 30 miles an hour, honestly, and it's a cool way to show people how to use bear spray properly. And then we already talked about the, the bear spray giveaways. They're really something the public really does like. Again, that just Google, if you're interested, you can just Google that uh, bear, bear fence deployment, Wyoming game of fish, something like that. But again, all these different things we do are trying to promote that, the reduce that conflict potential, showing how to properly deploy spray, bear spray. Finding areas where we can put up some infrastructure to reduce that up in the Cody country. And along, this is in our, our WHMA in Whiskey several years ago. And again, these are things that Brian already talked about, but it's a major component of everything we do every day. You heard the communications division talk about outreach. This is something all of our people, they're expected to go catch a bear and then go talk to 25 second graders about how to be safe in bear country. And again, the thinking of the future, creating a more interactive website. The, the videos that we're doing have a lot of outreach. So we're always trying to, to figure out a way to reach out to as many people as we possibly can. And so again, I, I talked about this at the beginning, but we're committed to maintaining and managing these animals on, on the landscape. Um, it's, it's very much a multi-layered approach, very different, ever-changing dynamics. I mean, the whole notion of having an intact carnivore guild is fairly new and an evolutionary scale. And so we're still learning from this and this vigilant conflict resolution program is essential as well as the outreach and education and all the intricacies of everything interwoven together in order to come to talk to you and talk to the public about what we do. And again, we're always answering, trying to answer questions because there's a lot of tough questions out there. None of these are easy questions or anybody be doing it. And so again, we're trying to manage those better for the public and for the wildlife of Wyoming. DeBolt found a lot of funny videos or funny little pictures. So. If any of you had any other questions, be happy to try to answer. Go ahead. Um, understanding, Correct. Correct, there is a new ordinance in Teton County that requires bear resistant infrastructure. And they do have, we're, we're, we're a member of Bear Wise Jackson Hole, and it's a multi-agency group, just like we have a lot of community programs um, in different areas of the state, but they do have a specific Bear Wise coordinator, which we work closely with. Now, my question is, Well, he just called me right before this, actually, with a question. So, yeah, we worked very closely with him. Very good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, Dr. Um, 
when you go to campgrounds, like you know, your standard forest service campground, um, sometimes I see two storage lockers or something like that. And it's for this question of the size that look like the emergencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question is, does the game and fish offer to install those? Do you install them? Is that forest service has to do them? Do you know? Yes, I do. Uh, uh, members of the commission, Commissioner Masterson, uh, it's it's very it's a team approach. So it's not necessarily on our WHMAs, we install them, but we definitely help install them on the forest, on BLM, on state lands. And we're always trying to increase that footprint. And it's not specific to grizzly bear areas. I, I used decades ago, it was more specific to that, but we've got a lot of black bear food reward situations throughout the state. So um, it's very much a team approach to, to, try to, to try to move those in other areas. So it's, Uh, Dan, you and your large carnivore section are one of my favorite presenters. I could ask you questions for the next hour, but uh, we've got to keep moving. Do we have anybody online with comments about large carnivore? We do have, we have some, some in the room, so I would ask you to stay close by. Anybody online? Wayne? Okay, let's go with Daniel first. Hi, Daniel. You want to come about uh, large carnivores? Uh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, it was a very helpful presentation. Very informational. Um, my comment is, or what I want to address a little bit is obviously the the predators uh, with this winter that we're having. Uh, first off, I'm I'm gonna been an outfitter for 24 years in Utah and Wyoming both um, and have had a lot of experience with with uh, predators and run-ins on ground and and bad winters and what can occur from that so um, what I'm worried about is the the death loss that we're projecting or, or that we're going to experience in in Wyoming this year and what we're going to do about it from a predator standpoint um, we're going to probably be 50 to 75% death loss on a, on a unit that's trying to manage 40,000 deer is our, uh, the objective is what I understand. Um, if we get knocked down to 10,000 deer and we take away 75% of the, of the prey and we have the same amount of predators on the landscape, uh, you fall into something that's called a predator uh, trap. We'll, we'll have more predators on the ground. It won't let us rebound. We won't be able to rebound back up to, to the goal of 40,000 deer. Um, is there something that you guys are going to do to address uh, the lions and the bears and the, uh, the amount of wildlife that they kill on an annual basis, especially when we're going to lose the number of deer that we, we do this year? I don't see my bosses coming up. So I, no, I, um, uh, Sir, to your, to your answer, I, I think one thing we've done is, is increase harvest in a lot of areas where predation was never a limiting factor, but was a factor that we wanted to address. The high harvest we've had on black bears and mountain lions and, and research, is, we haven't seen a lot of issues with ish, um, additive impacts from black bears as far as a predation standpoint. But we do know mountain lions are a significant predator to mule deer, that's obvious. Uh, so we have increased harvest in Many of these areas continue to maintain high harvest mortality limits for those areas. So I guess that's our, our current response to that. So we're going to be uh, proactive, or I would suggest to be proactive rather than reactive. Um, down here in Utah, I'm, I have a, a bunch of ground leased up right on the Utah-Wyoming line. In the 2018-19 winter, we lost 75% of our deer herd. Um, and we were on a lion quota unit that uh, we essentially got abolished where they were issuing only seven lion tags for the Chalk Creek drainage. They increased that to 15 um, after that 75% die off and we killed 15 cats in six days. They gave us another 15 tags. We killed another 15 cats in, in 11 days and then they gave us depredation tags. That winter alone, we got up to 52 lions 
on 80,000 acres. And the pre, and then after that, the two years after that, uh, we killed over 40 lions each year. So we're over 140 lions on 80,000 acres in Shaw Creek at 75 deer per cat per year. Uh, we didn't even have enough deer on the landscape to feed the number of lions that were here. And, you know, no one can predict a winter like we're having this year uh, in Wyoming or Utah. But uh, if, if, the, if you guys don't get ahead of these, you know, that, what I, I view the predators as a controllable. I mean, I would, we've taken down here in Utah an approach, kind of take the gloves off to, to manage these predators until we can get to our object, objective or at least 50 to 60% of our objective. Um, and then if we're below that, then it's, you know, and we don't control a controllable, which would be issuing licenses to black bears and, and uh, mountain lions. Uh, you know, most of these units that are, you guys have objectives on up there are filled in two or three weeks and you've hit your objective or your quota. And I mean, that, that in my mind, it should tell you that you're not issuing anywhere near the amount of tags you should be if in a three week period, especially on toms, you're you already hit your quota and the season's over. And and then you add on top of that a 50 to 75 percent winter kill. Um, it's you know, if, if you're not proactive, the the new cap on your deer uh, will be 10,000 deer instead of 40,000 deer it'll take such a long time for them to rebound and get back up to where they were. And heaven forbid in the next two or three years, we have another winter like we had right now. Uh, you, we won't even be talking about a deer herd to hunt. So, I mean, I just, my, I guess I'm just concerned that uh, we should try to get ahead of the curve rather than uh, react and be more proactive rather than reactive. You know, a lot of studies I looked into and I've talked to a lot of biologists Randy Larson, I was on the phone with him for uh, three and a half hours this morning. He's a biologist for BYU. Um, two thirds of, of every neonatal species across the country, uh, 10 different species, two thirds of them from zero to six months are killed by a predator. So, I mean, it's the number one cause of death is predators. So it's something that we can control, that you guys have the power to control. You can issue more tags. You can, you can give it to, you know, the houndsmen and, and the general public who want to go hunt these animals to, to control them. And you lose that amount of food source for them. They have to go down the same, the same rate that the deer go down. So if we don't do something about that, then uh, I think, you know, we really be regretting where we'll be on our deer in Wyoming. Um, so that's, that's pretty much my comments. I, you know, there's, there's areas down here where uh, the book cliffs, uh, the unit, the book cliff unit, um, a, a fawn, a neonatal to get, has 11% chance of making it to one year old strictly because of black bears. So every unit is different in which predator is predominantly controlling and the numbers and what they prey on. But I mean, we have a huge unit that, I mean, at 11% chance of even making it to a one year old as a deer. So uh, because of a black bear and, and we, we don't have anywhere near the amount of bears that you guys do up there. Um, I would suggest removing the, the sow limit, a certain number of sows killed and you shut the, so you shut the season down and, you know, I would work over the predators. That's one thing that is, that, that is within our power to control to try and bring the deer back because this year they're they're going to take it on the chin like they haven't for a long time and if we don't do something about it then we won't have anything to even hunt in the future so that'll be my two cents on it i appreciate your time and you guys did a great job with your presentation thank you thanks for, thanks for your comments daniel this commission's never uh shied away from being aggressive with with predator uh license allocation so we're going to watch the data this year see what birthing rates are when we go into next fall season settings and quotas. Um, but yeah, we <clears throat> we think we're on top of it. We respect Dan Thompson and his team's efforts. Director, did you want to talk yeah. about uh, non-licensed predators? Yeah, so I, and I, you probably missed it, sir. I appreciate your feedback. So my director's report today, I did commit 
to the commission that we would evaluate both sides of the equation, both predator and prey. And in the face of a unprecedented winter, we will look at, and we have, as we have in the past, we will um, evaluate the potential um, effective use of coyote control in certain places and fawning areas. We will evaluate our quotas for mountain lions and black bears, and and um, we'll make appropriate recommendations to the commission when we do that. Don't you, you know? Don't um, think that we're not going to um, consider the seriousness of this winter and the role um, that all things. Um, including predators, have on the recovery of our big game. Very good. All right. So that's all we have online. So in the room, we have uh, some blue sheets. Uh, no particular order. Brian Taylor, would you like to come speak to us about large carnivores? Yes, thank you for uh, taking this opportunity to hear the general public on this. I appreciate that. I'm, I, I will apologize in advance. I'm not overly polished at uh, speaking to you. I've spoke with you before. I actually, I don't think there's a member of the commission that is seating now that was here when I spoke to this in Cody some time ago. It was, it was, I think it was like 16. And I'm, I went back to my notes and they're almost identical. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission and Director Nesvik, I do appreciate you taking the time to hear us. Uh, I am very concerned about the number of predators on the landscape and I'm gonna back up just a little bit. I'm Brian Taylor. I've lived in the Grove Island for river drainage for uh, three generations. I'm embarking on my 40th year of full-time guiding for our outfitting business. And uh, uh, change is tough. Don't get me wrong. I've, I've seen a lot of change in that 40 years of what we're dealing with up there, but uh, I'm tied in a little bit with some of the projections for licenses. I would advise us to move slowly with increasing any tags uh, on some cow elk that are in the area or the ewes on the sheep population. Um, this winter's tough everywhere. It's, we're used to snow and where I'm from, but our snow is tough this year. We still have two feet on the level at the ranch and it's, it's pretty wide over there. Um, and before I uh, go too far, I did speak with Ken Mills at length the other day. I told him I didn't want to blindside him on this. Uh, I'm going to speak mainly about the wolf, obviously. Uh, Ken and I had a good conversation. He was very Congenial about taking my comments. We had a good conversations like we do in public or in person when we do have those conversations and it went well. Um, the tag sales for the wolf is down 50%, what he told me. Harvest percentage is 2%. We're down from roughly 5,000 tags sold to a little over 2,000 tags sold. The novelty of wolf hunting is over. You know, the, uh, it's tough. I hunted every day in the month of November. I didn't hunt hard every day, but some days I hunted pretty hard. And I was unsuccessful. Uh, the winter closure that has happened in the Grove on drainage, uh, there's uh, members of your department. There, I think I know one of them is here that is very much aware of this. We lost two weeks off the uh, wolf hunting season. Crucial two weeks in uh, December, we lost a very critical time to hunt them. They're, they're smart, they're nocturnal. Uh, Ken Mills mentioned that they have a hard time even classifying them from the air now. He says they get in the timber, they're very tough to classify, even from the helicopter. Um, I'm covering my ground pretty quick, so you're lucky. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ken and I talked about maybe selling unlimited tags. We can buy two now. Maybe making it for those of us that do. There's kind of a fraternity of us that hunt. I can count them probably on my two hands, the number of guys that kind of hit it. I know over by Cody, he says there's, uh, there's more guys do get at it over there pretty seriously. 
but unlimited uh, tags. We also talked about including wolf tag on every elk tag like they used to the black bear. That's been gone a long time, but thinking outside the box. Uh, I don't feel like certain segments of the state should have to support the numbers. And the Grove wants supporting a lot of wolves. I can put a hard number of 30 in the drainage right now. The elk feeder up there at the patrol cabin is a firm number on 22 right on the feed ground part-time, two different packs. We've had over time to say seven to 10 around the ranch, have singles here and there. They're, they're, uh, they're definitely hard to see. Since December, I think I've seen two in the daylight. Um, Dan mentioned that there's uh, 30 wolves were uh, taken in the trophy zone. You know, we have 30 in the Grove on. And, you know, they're big. They're fast. They're, they're all you want to be if you're the top of the food chain. They're tough. Um, it's written in the wolf plan that the game and fish has the authority to curtail the population if they're having adverse uh, effects on the wildlife. That's, I think, uh, chapter 39, paragraph two. And um, I think at some year, some, some instances, that needs to be exercised. This year was one of those. There was a quota of 12. We got four of them. I was there the morning after they killed the horses, the horse up at the ranch above us. And I will give a plug to these guys. Uh, your, your, your man, uh, um, Mike Boyce, I, 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 knew I, was the, I know him well. He was there before we were there before daylight. They are outstanding on their response time. John Stevens, everybody in the red shirts over there is more than accommodating in these situations. They, they are, are great. Sometimes they beat us to the rendezvous site where we're gonna go and go look at stuff. When we used to have cattle, they were outstanding. Um, we need to maintain high quotas, if not increase them, and hopefully we'll have better luck, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with the harvest. Um, I'm gonna uh, use a quote that I, uh, a, a colleague of the outfitting world over there said to, a, to us at a meeting one time, we meet, need management at the right time. And isn't that the truth? We need to, if it is a problem, we need to address it. Like uh, uh, the gentleman on the, on the uh, phone mentioned, you know, we're reactive in so many of these instances and it's really nobody's fault. You know, I wouldn't have predicted that we were going to have the numbers we have in the Grove Aunt this year coming out of fall, but they show up. The harder winter maybe pushed more in from the east. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's obviously a, a very viable option for them. As wolves, it's open. There's animals there. One year they did flush the animals out of that country. Uh, the objective is 3,500 elk in that drainage in the winter. It was down to 78 that year that they classified following the same routes they do. That was, I think, the winter of 17, 18. We don't want to get back to that situation because then you habituate those animals that are supposed to stay there down to the NER, the National Elk Refuge. Uh, we lost one of the feed grounds in the Grove on. That was a critical loss. Uh, I like to call them winter elk management areas. And that's what they are. That's how you manage elk in deep snow country is by supplemental habitat, if you will. Um, with that, you know, I, I, I don't want to wear you out with this, but it is, uh, I live on the battlefield up there. There's a quote from one of our past presidents that it's awful easy to be a farmer when you're a thousand miles from the plow. And it's easy to think about it, you know, here in Casper, I mean, we're bare ground out here. But when you see it, my wife has taken hundreds of pictures. I've had to finish the task of 
killing domestic livestock after they've maimed them. I, like I said, I was there the morning, the morning after they uh, got into the colts up at the neighboring ranch. It wasn't pretty. One had ran into a gate, marred his face all up. I was surprised that didn't go against the claim, to be honest with you. But uh, nonetheless, I'm, uh, I've lived it ever since they were introduced, and I use that word introduced. These are Canadian wolves. These aren't the little fuzzy things that are depicted in some places. They're big. They're feet as big as my hand, and I live on it. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I would take a question, comment, or criticism. Uh, but I do appreciate your time. Any comments or criticism for Mr. Taylor? <laughs> Mr. Taylor, I appreciate your comments. I do have a question for you. You mentioned a winter closure that shortened up our season. Is that a forest service closure, or what, what's that closure that, that limited our hunting season? Yes, Chairman uh, Brokaw. It, it was a closure that was implemented by the Forest Service, not supported by the, the Game and Fish. I, I do know for a fact the Game and Fish was opposed to that two-week uh, curtailment of the season. What that their excuse was, was to bring it in line with the other closures in the region. It made it a forest-wide, one-date-fits-all closure but it eliminated that opportunity for, you know, not, not just us as trying to fulfill a wolf quota, but also, you know, people couldn't go harvest their Christmas trees. It closes the road. So in it, you know, we all, it was in 1988, we lost out. I used to be more of a snowmobiler than I am now. We lost a lot of winter range, but we all bought in. It was for the sake of the game. We, uh, we bought in on the winter closures for the sake of the wildlife. We were given avenues to get into the more of the backcountry in places. But when they closed that all off, we can't run snowmobiles. You know, you're not supposed to any human presence, basically, except in the corridors. But when they took that away, you know, you're limited to these corridors. And um, you can access some opportunities through these corridors, and Ken and I did talk about that, would maybe lengthen the season into January. But then I can probably count on one hand the number of us that might take advantage of those opportunities because you have to have a snowmobile to access further back in and then hunt from there. It, it's, it's just, it's uh, difficult. Yeah, well, my, my thought is when this commission, um, you mentioned a quota of 12 in your area. Correct. Our intent is to kill 12 wolves. Correct. So we need to move, if, if season dates is conflicting with <clears throat> forest closures, then we need to look at that and see if we can schedule our season to accommodate our quota kill. So thanks for bringing that up. I, I wasn't aware of that, but we'll look at that on next season settings. Make sure that we have as much time as possible to reach our quotas. I appreciate that. And the reason I'm commenting on this today is because it just kind of falls in line with their presentation, but I won't be able to attend the July uh, okay. meeting. But I do appreciate you taking my comments. Save them for July. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, we have Mr. Hedges would like to talk about large carnivores. Logan? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Logan Hedges. I'm over in the great city of Smoot. And, you know, I just want to address a few things on these predators. Over in that country right now, um, it's kind of nice to be here. I'm not a big fan of Casper, but it's kind of nice with no snow on the ground. We left a lot of snow over in that country this morning to come over here. And 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 our game looks pretty rough over in that country. And and um, just just a few things I wanted to kind of address is, you know, that mule deer herd is is pretty special to us. I hope it's special to everybody here. And, you know, I watched it. I watched when it was really, really good in my younger years and hunting with my dad when he was outfitting and guiding in that country. And and it was it was pretty awesome. And boy, it has been hurting lately. And a lot of that has to do with predators, regardless of what anybody says. Um I've been hunting bears in that country since I was 11 years old. And this will be my 34th year hunting bears there. And we got some baits that we've had established since that time. And, you know, we got lots of bears on there. When I was a kid, 
the first bear we ever killed when I was 11 years old with a friend of my dad's. I mean, we spent two years before we ever saw a bear on any of those baits over there. I and mean, we had to work really hard to even see a bear. And a bear sighting was really, really rare. And, you know, now my boys are hunting over there. They had 17 bears on that same bait that we killed that bear on 34 years ago. 17. And three of those were sows with cubs. And, you know, if nothing else, I'd like to see us do something about the bears. Just make my kids have to work a little harder. You know, they're kind of, they're kind of spoiled, honestly. I tell them stories about the good old days, only seeing one or two bears, and I don't even think they believe me. You know, they, um, both my boys are 16 and 18 now, and they, they'd kill the bear every year up until this last year. And I said, no more. You guys aren't killing bears anymore. Last thing we need is another bear at this house. So, um, so they took their friends with them. And they just started taking friends from school and they killed four mature bears this, this last spring over there. Those kids, I never went with them, maybe helped them take a little bait in here and there. They killed four mature bears, saw well over 20 bears that they saw, plus a lot of other bears we had on camera. And, and I'd invite any, anybody here, anyone on the commission, whatever, to come over and see it. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. I enjoy seeing bears. Um, and, you know, I'm just personally, I don't want to kill another bear, but I'm kind of at the point, like I talked to some of these meetings earlier that, you know, if that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do. And if we need to fill these quotas, I told James Hobbs over there, our game warden, I said, James, if you want us to fill these quotas, we'll fill these quotas. If that's what it takes to get us there. I don't want to go kill a bunch of young sows and bring them in there for him to check. I mean, I don't think that's the right thing to do, but I do think we need to address these bears and these bears regardless of what anybody says, you're not going to convince me otherwise. I've seen them kill a lot of fawns. Um, they're tough on things. The best thing that the state of Wyoming is doing right now is allowing us to bait in the spring because we hold a lot of bears on those baits where they're not out after these fawns. They're not after these calf ale and that. So I know whether it's legal or not, usually at the end when we go to pull baits, we have a tendency to dump a little extra bait out just to try to hold bears there. So, you because know, we don't want them bears going and hitting these fawns, especially because our deer are hurting. And then after this winter, I think our hands are kind of being forced, everybody, that we have got to do something. I'll let some of these other guys talk about the mountain lions. Um, so I won't, don't want to take up too much time because I don't specialize in lions like I do bears. I killed a few lions. And I mean, I just, there's a lot of cats there. Same thing when I was a kid, you know, it was hard to go find a lion track. Now I can get up in the morning and go run up a few of those canyons and cut a track for a buddy of mine that has hounds, give them a phone call and let them know where they're at. You know, it's, it's really not that tough to do. So the biggest problem is usually by the time that, you know, I have time to go do it or we can get a kid out of school to go hunt one, quotas are filled up. So that kind of, that part of it gets a little frustrating to us. So I just um, would really like you to look a little closer at bears and especially with our deer numbers going down. Does, do we have an idea, um, Director Nesvik, of what our deer numbers are going to be on that Wyoming range? Has anybody kind of predicted that yet? Yeah, so our caller information indicates that we had as much as um, 50 to 60 percent adult uh, mortality, so significant losses. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, so that's what I'd ask of you to look at a little closer. And, you know, I don't have the answers for it, but one thing. If, if we'll all look at it, and I talked with Freilich the other day, um, from 17, that winter of 17, our deer herd, when we came out of that winter, we were right around that 29,000 range. And in December, when they counted again and did a really good count, I've looked at, his, at what he's got there of all his data is the exact same. So our deer have done nothing but flatline since then. And even with some mild winters and you know, we can talk about habitat and everything, and, and those are all things I we'd like to address, but they're going to take longer. We can hammer predators right now. We These are one of our controllables that we can, if we really focus on, I think we can make a difference. And I'd like to just have everybody kind of address that and look at it. So, I appreciate those comments. Um, Logan, what hunt area are you in for bears? I'm in 30 is where we mainly had all the Grays River and Star Valley country. Okay. So. Well, we'll be sure to look at that quota. And you okay. get our summer data because we're learning we have a lot of bears. We do. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Ty Heiner. Trey, sorry.
I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I probably don't have to, sounds like everybody else pretty stressed on all the same issues that we all have, but um, I just want to, you know, just reiterate what Logan kind of said, um, and Sy can probably vouch for me. Um, do you guys, I mean, do you know how many bears are in the Grays River, your estimate? Yeah. I'm not good at math. You know how many, like in the Wyoming range, like a number wise, the estimation. Gotcha. Okay, so I run 20 baits in there. I'm sure Cy does too. And I had 68 different bears on camera between those baits in there. And you guys are trying to get numbers through your hair snare stuff. I mean, I'll invite you into my baits. I mean, you go into the barrels, there's hair stuck all over them. You can pull all the samples you want. Out of them barrels help if you help you get your numbers. Oh, we really need to. And can you guys even go and adjust your quotas this year? I know you just set them quotas already. Can you guys go and reevaluate those? The answer to your question is yes. Okay, awesome. I've if for nothing else, when I leave here, I just ask that you guys go back and look at those and maybe up those quotas. I mean, in 30, we the quote the south quota used to be, I believe, 30. And for some reason, they they took it took six away. You know, I've had years that I've had to send hunters home early or cut weeks off my my hunts because of the quota filled early. So, I mean, you can. I mean, I think we all know that we could you could take completely get rid of the quotas, and I mean, they're resilient animals. You're not gonna kill them out. I mean, you can they can handle all the hunting pressure in the world on them, and you're never gonna kill them out. Same with lions. I had, I ran eight lion hunters this year. I killed eight lions in nine days in there. I only hunted nine days and killed eight lions. I mean, that's ridiculous. And then I went there the other day, wolf hunting. I cut five more fresh lion tracks. I got to my camp. I have a tent set up, shoveled my tent up. Oh, when I almost got there, a deer walked across the road in front of me, which is pretty unheard of up there right now. There's eight feet of snow. By the time I shoveled that tent off, turned around, drive down the road, I come back down. It was only two hours. A lion had come through and killed that deer already. I mean, it's just they're out of hand up there, and and that's our, I mean, that's that's just in the Grays River there. I mean, not counting not counting Star Valley, Piney Side, all that stuff. I mean, I think you guys don't. I don't want to say you don't have an idea, but there's way more lions and, and bears than what we're giving giving them, and they're doing way more damage than we think. Almost every one of them lions that I killed this year, I ran off a kill. So if you could, I ask request that maybe we re review our line and bear quotas and see if we, we can up them and help these deer out. Thanks. Any questions for Trey? Thank you. Okay, that completes blue sheets on large carnivores, but Senator Driscoll, the floor is yours. Please come forward. You can talk to us anytime though, help yourself. I'm just gonna follow on. Uh, thank all of you for uh, all you do. I, I truly admire everything you do. I've been down this path with predators with you and I've watched it in different areas. And I'd really encourage you to look strong at going into the predators proactively, not wait until you do your counts. We know the game counts are down. And I'd like you to look internally and ask you, what areas do you know that we've ever got in trouble with predators by overhunting? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's coyotes, mountain lions, bears. Doesn't seem like we, we managed to, to overkill them ever. But the game always rebounds. Anytime you pull the predators down, the game nearly always rebounds. And, I've seen it firsthand, you know, and we ran into Lion Deal. Your people talked about the presentation. We had two, three hundred people showed up in Hewlett, and we kind of went in pretty hard into the lions. And all of a sudden, we found out not only did our deer come back, but our turkeys all came back. I didn't know that lions were wiping our turkeys out. They, they all jumped. Uh, the other one that I hit, and it's never recovered ever, is... My family leased Homestead Mining's ground at Mosque and in 81, we had a storm that was similar to this winter, but it was a two day area. It was a hundred inches and it wiped out the deer herd. The coyotes came in and took the deer herd out. And I can tell you this, when you get a 60% reduction in mule deer numbers, 
and you've still got as many lions that are killing 60, 70 deer a year, they're gonna wipe your fawns out. I would really honestly, I, I think you need to go in and trim them back. They'll come back. Predators do fine coming back. The old deer don't. And a lot of our other species have a hard time. And, you know, for me, it's, uh, I, I've listened to the biologists and I respect them. They work their rear ends off. But I really honestly think that you'll be well ahead pull some of these predator populations down similar to what the others. I'll guarantee you they haven't taken the winter loss that your game has. And I'm concerned. I, you know, statewide, this is not a regional deal. This is, you guys are hit. Maybe my area less than anywhere, maybe. But uh, it's terrifying to see what happens. And if you drop 60% and then you, then you have no fawn recruitment the next year, it just cuts out another two or three years for recovery. So, you know, my thought is, uh, this commission, I'm going to look you guys in the eyes. The department's not going to do it. It will take the commission to make them get into the predators. And I would hope you do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You're foreshadowing some of the conversations some commissioners have had today as we <clears throat> start on those chapters tomorrow. We've had that discussion. If we're going to cut our, our deer tags, for example, can we increase our predator tags in those herd areas? And, we're gonna have that discussion tomorrow. I don't know the logistics of that, the legalities of it yet, but the commission's talking about it. So uh, perfect. Thank you. And I'll be back tomorrow. I've got lots of things. Winter kill situation. So I'll be here for what I can in tomorrow. I, I've got a deal to end in the morning as soon as it's over with, or as soon as I'm done with it, I'm gonna come back. Uh, I think this is you guys got a lot of Wyoming in your hands, you know. This is you look what Wyoming is, and the, the game birds are a big part of it. And you're at a time that's, uh, I'm glad we got you guys here. You're all, you care and you're good. This is not a time to air the, we let the wolves or the coyotes or the bears take out another 10 or 15% of our herd when it's down. I think if you're going to air, and that was my comments on the lions at home is, if you're worried about them recovering, maybe you better take a, a, a chance as far as predator. But I'd err to the side of having not enough predators for a few years, because I can assure you, you can pull back those lion and bear tags and they'll come back pretty rapidly. They do well as long as they got food. And I, I think you're going to see it's already happening. The lions are in town now. I was reading a, one of the articles and you, your lions are hitting down now. And they're like, well, we're not sure if they're changing patterns. That's your biologist. I can tell you why they're coming down. They're out of things to eat. They're they're going to be into calves and they're going to be into a whole lot of other species for the guys that live out there. They're, they're not going to die. They aren't going to starve to death. They'll eat your dog or down the road if they need to. So I, I thank you for the time. Thank you, Senator. You're not wrong. They'll eat fluffy if they can get this. You want to just keep going? Okay. Um, no more public comment on... Large carnivores, Dan, Brian, thank you. As far as I'm concerned, one of the best presenters of the year. Just fantastic. Okay, next agenda item, Craig Smith, Deputy Chief, Dan Chaplain Appeal 23096. Chief Smith, what you got for us? Mr. President, members of the commission, Director Nesbick, Craig Smith, Deputy Chief, Wildlife Division. Uh, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a real quick summary, and then procedurally, we'll turn it over to Fred Meyer, who's here with the Whitetail Ranch. This is a claim that he submitted, and then we'll also have Warden Supervisor David Ellsworth present uh, the investigation report for the department. So we'll real briefly, uh, department received a claim from Fred Meyer uh, for the amount of $309,065 for damage to grain corn and silage, corn grown for silage. The department investigated the claim that was submitted by, by Mr. Meyer and uh, the results of that investigation, we offered a payment of $64,347.87. So in summary, what's at stake here is a, a difference of $244,717 between the amount claimed by Mr. Meyer and the amount that the department uh, is allowed to pay through the regulation. So with that, I will have Mr. Meyer come forth and we'll get his presentation going. Yeah. 
push out the year. Mr. Chairman and commissioners, I've been here before two years ago. The damages were sustained and are profound. The way that came and fish, we've been over this two years ago, analyzes these damages is no good. It's an antiquated way to analyze the damages. I'm gonna show you on this. What we've done this last year, we've got crop scientists, we've got seed experts, we've got fertilizer people, everything that we're gonna show you here, we're capable of backing up with paperwork. We tested all of our soil, which we do every year, did a plan with crop scientists and everybody for our 200 to 220 bushel corn. We implemented that plan, fertilizers, sprays, waters, and harvest, but we didn't get it. And the reason we didn't get it, we'll go through right here. Mr. Okay. Meyer, yes. while you're clicking sides, uh, would you pull your microphone down to you a little bit? They're not able to hear you on the internet. They're afraid I was going to talk too loud. <laughs> Thank you. This was done by our, our crop expert. I guess I moved ahead too fast. Uh, Brian Andreas, a cert certified crop advisor. We have him every year to come in there, do an analyzation, keep a study on the animals. I think Brian and my son and some are on the line, uh, 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 maybe not. Uh, but anyhow, if you go across this board here, it comes up with the various percentages that he does on all of his checks and what he comes up with. And, and a, as you do this and follow these tables, uh, when you get over here into this uh, 18th uh, 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 category to the far right, you're looking at 90% damages. The way the Fish and Game analyzes this, and we'll, we'll see a, a chart in a little bit as they walk across there ever so many feet and try to count so many years. And these guys work hard at doing it, but it's not right. They aren't counting kernels that are, are uh, on the ears, why the ears are not developing because the silks have been pulled or the flag leaves have been eaten. What we've done is taken pictures of that corn early. The, the, the game, the deer and the elk started in this uh, early this year, not a, not a lot earlier. Uh, but we was in there in, in early July. We contacted the game wardens and stuff to see how we could mitigate it this year, or, or uh, last year here. We come up here with the, the damages uh, difference on bushels per acre that it lost. Now, mind you, you, you can raise corn on that desktop with water, fertilizer, and feeding it and everything right. You know, solution. That's what hydroponics is about. When you put it in the ground, it's the same thing. After they've done all these damages and the calculations and stuff, we come up with $309,000 in damages. Now, I, I, I understand that you, most of you have been provided a uh, paper copy. If not, we can get you all a, a booklet of this presentation so it can be studied because we have uh, other suggestions and, and everything like that. Uh, you got fields here that they're coming up with 7% damage. It's over 50% damaged. I think I know how to run this. Oh, there you go. Oh. When, we, when we get to this thing, I analyze this thing on these damages and I go down through, through what, what's happening here. And I hear these outfitters and stuff talking. Everybody wants to hunt deer. They get paid. Fish and game gets paid. Towns get paid. Gun sales people get paid. You can see it all right there. The people that don't get paid 
of the private landowners that's providing a bunch of this feed that in fact does keep some of these animals alive in winters that we have like, like right now. And it costs money, it costs big time money to do that. It cost us 300,000 this last year. There's where it started. Nate's your game warden. I have, uh, I have probably 75 of uh, these texts between uh, fish and game and, and myself uh, trying, to, trying to mitigate these damages because of the fights we've been over, in over the years. We're just to the point we can't absorb it anymore. Uh, David and, and everybody tried helping with that. We was asking to put some fencing and stuff up. My son that runs these farms and stuff happens to have a sickness that we had to have him in Arizona for. And so we've lost his help for, for hopefully for a while. Uh, these are game and fish drones pictures. This, this is in July. Those Texas stuff you were talk, uh, you seen earlier is stuff that uh, I was talking to Nate and him about. Some of these are a little later, the corn is tassel on these. But you can see the numbers there. And, and the answer is not to kill the game off. Uh, we can take some of them. But we, we're not in the position that we're saying to wipe them out either. As I talked to you last time, you can, you can see the pictures as we go down through here of the animals that the, these are off of your guys' drones. But they quit sending them to me because I think they knew what I was going to do with these pictures. They lay down on them drones and stuff in there. Now that's, it looks innocent enough at that point, but later on, you're gonna see what happens uh, as the year passes on. There's where they're starting to top it off. See the, see the leaves and stuff they're eating off and the flag leaves? That, those, leaves those plants don't go ahead and develop correctly and don't develop, develop, develop ears properly. Uh, they've, they've been damaged big time and there's a lot of them out there that are damaged. So when, when your people walk through there and that plant don't have an ear, they can't count that. It's a no air plant. It ain't the plant's fault. It's not the fertilizer's fault. It's not the water's fault. And it's not the feed's fault. That's been damaged. And it's been damaged by deer and elk. There's Brian Andreas's report and the pictures. I put that in there so you can go back there and he refers to the pictures and where he took them because he keeps going back and rechecking all of it and everything. Uh, so that uh, I want you guys to see what really is happening. Look at these pictures here. You see the leaves and stuff already on the ground on the, them young plants. You'll see back in that plant there, the silks and stuff is pulled off of them little ears there. They don't develop. Some, some plant. See the, see the ears? You, you, if you look, look, in, look deep in there, you see the damage in there already uh, when it's early like that. And them, them, them little fuzzy tops right there, those plants are gone. And, and when you put a, put a couple hundred head of elk out there in them fields, it, it's like walking a cow herd or anything else through there. Again, he took them pictures right there to show the, show the prints back on the, them same spots. That's what, how they turn out later. He wanted to show 
the, the uh, Brian did where the damage is done. There's elk tracks in there. You can see the elk tracks right there where the leaves and stuff are tore down. And it's not only elk, it's white-tailed deer. Uh, these are some of the same spots later in the year where they've dam uh, they damaged them and the plants are dying. Right there's some damage. That right there is some of the same fields. He's, he's doing the tape measure because he goes out there and he measures it. There's 17 and a half foot multiplied out. How much damage is done in an acre? How many how many errors have been there? Now, I read the report and stuff, and I see where they're saying wind damage and stuff like that. There's not wind damage there. When you see wind damage, you see you see ears that are popped off laying on the ground. You see plants that are broken over, but not like that. They're laying over. There was more of it. As you look look into them fields and stuff, if you look into those right there, them husks don't have anything in them because they've been pulled out. Right there is satellite vision. That the the we have a monitor on the combine hooked with a satellite that monitors the yields on in those fields. When you go back to that field right there and you come to this report, they're claiming, let's see, that's area, that's six. I'm sorry, I thought I was more organized than that on this. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. If you go to uh, Pivot 6 in your report that was uh, sub, uh, given to you uh, on this, that uh, the game and uh, fish uh, calculated the, the damages on, they're saying on, on that field right there, That there's seven percent damage. They're saying that they're saying that that is a seven percent damage on that field. Mind you, down at the bottom is zero. Look at the colors. That stuff up there, the darkest, darkest green, is still only making 180 bush. Now you look at that. Outside of them circles is 10 percent. Of the of the of the field. Yeah, we got a seven percent damage here. Look at the sides. Look at the yellow. There's no way that there's a seven percent damage there. In fact, there's a right at a fifty one percent damage. Now, you don't, you guys are talking about tracking bears and every other thing with satellites. This is as accurate as them. This is three feet one way or another where, where that bushel was made off of those satellites on these yield monitors. You can see the damage in, in, in there. I, I, I won't slow these up because you, you know what you're looking at down through there. There are game paths right down through them. You can see, see the game paths themselves down through there. 
Ears are eaten half off, silks are pulled, flag leaves were pulled, plants broke over. And when, you, when you're hunting during hunting season and you got people bouncing them elk back and forth like off the Highway 34 and stuff, it's like running a thrash machine down through there. But in this case, the damages were done before that because you don't see a bunch of ears laying on the ground. You can just go on and on and on on, on, on this thing. This is, uh, that was pivot two and three there. Uh, there'll be more pictures of that. But I think on two and three, they're saying, uh, they're saying, two and three, they're saying uh, on that, that's a 19, almost a 20% damage. But it's, it's a hell of a lot more than that. You'll see here. This is real early damage where it was devastated real early. You can see where the plants were eaten off and then that weeds come on even through the spray and everything. Wherever it's real early or been damaged, you can see the top of them corn where they're purple and stuff, all the flag leaves were pulled off early. Okay, this this is this is how you calculate it. All those little blue lines there is where your people have walked. Count it, and David can tell you more about it. They walk so far, analyze the ears. Well, hell on them damaged plants, some of them ears might only be that big and have maybe 20 or 30 kernels compared to what they usually have and, and be about that long because they've been damaged. You can see the density with which they're walking. That's not very much for a circle. It's down and back. You can't analyze crops that way at the price everything is and what our operating costs are. You guys need to go to the satellites. Now, in all fairness to David, he asked for our satellite images. And because I'm not as smart as my kids and some of them, I've had to learn this stuff on a crash course. And I've got two of the, I, I have two of the five circles that I got uh, satellite images on because I finally got a hold of the people that run it back there and they, they was able to explain to an old timer how to do it. Uh, my boy has, that handles this all the time, has cancer and he's been down in Arizona at the Cancer Centers of America. So I, I didn't bother him about that. I thought I had this thing shut off. It's your wife, go ahead and take it. But if not, no. let's, let's stay focused. Well, she just wanted to spend some of that money I'm losing. <laughs> uh, there's, there's the RJ circle. Look at all the light green, the real light green. Five years ago, that circle made 226 bushel an acre. We gave it more water this last year than we did then. And it was fertilized for the 220 bushel an acre. But look at the yields down here. They done that by tons. Uh, I, I hit the wrong button on the monitor, so it gave me tons of grain rather than bushels per acre. Because all you got to do is convert that with a 56 pound per bushel structure, you, you multiply those tons out by 2,000, for instance, that's 4.9 by 2,000, and divide it by uh, 56, and it tells you how many bushels per acre. But if you look at that on, that, on that circle there, on that RJ, they're saying that that's a 7.73, almost an 8% damage. Yet the outer circle of it's 10%. And then come in and look at the red. Look at the yellow. Look at the real light green. The dark green over here on the right-hand side is some of the higher yield.
These are pictures of that same circle at harvest time. Every one of these got the RJ on them. You can look out across there, look plumb into the picture. It's damaged all the way through there. Look at that. You can see plumb to the other end of the field on the trees. It should have these tassels and stuff all still up there. The air should be, you see the game paths? See, see those game paths down through there? We go back now and look look at the uh, the green stuff where the, where the damages were. Some of this stuff, guys, I got like two slides at a time because again, you, you got to forgive me on some of this stuff. Then I just want you to see the pictures of these as whole. You're looking across whole fields. You aren't looking at just portions of it. You can see how devastating that early stuff is to those late, the plants don't even develop. Where they've been broke off. See that little short air in front? That's because, because them, them tassels were pulled out. See the elk tracks there? That, that weeds right there is because of the early damage. See the purple stalks and stuff? I took these pictures off the combine. Now, we're at the end of it. Not, there's, a, there's a blank slide there. That's because you guys didn't want to have that slide on there. What that is, is an outfitter giving me the finger. Now, I don't know who that's gonna hurt or how we're gonna be that woke about this thing. But the fact of it is, I have to put up with that. I got an out, I got 80 acres of BLM sitting alongside a county road that I lease. He's sitting on the BLM out of the tracks, flipping me the finger because I'm after his ass all the time about running that game through my fences and stuff when they run down the pick, run down the roads and stuff. When you go back in there and look, we haven't put expenses in there for fencing, labor for fencing. Labor for putting this together. There's a lot of, we, we, we got as much alfalfa as we have. And I told you guys last time, uh, we was gonna start uh, looking at it early. And I talked to Nate early about putting cages out, but we didn't. We've got much alfalfa as we do uh, corn. But the thing about our operation is it's condensed. It's got pivots that are all in a specific area. It can be fenced. You're getting all these donations and whatever to do the overpasses and whatever you're doing. But you will not come out there and put in three to four miles of high, high, high fence that will stop 80% of this. And yet we'll sit up here and argue about $300,000 in damages that you want to give me $65,000 for. That's my money. That's money I borrowed to put in my crop to get my return. It's just like me coming in there and cutting 80% of your guys' checks right out, taking it out of your face. That's what happens here. And worse than that, that game damage cannot be covered by any type of crop insurance, including the federal crop insurance. It works against us. It can't be counted. So it lowers the yields. And if you ever get hailed out or anything, that you don't have a, the type of yield you should have. This year is going to hit us profoundly on what our averages are going to be that's kept in the federal ASSC offices. It hurts us bad, not only cash wise, but future cash. So I am upset big time because we visited this before, all of you, maybe these two guys. We've all talked about this. I don't get donations and stuff to put fences and stuff up 
I like the game. I'm interested in helping with the game. We're implementing plans to help pull, pull games off of these circles. We'll be planting turnips. We'll be uh, uh, doing a lot of stuff to provide different types of covers. Across from us and around from us is BLM and state and what have you. They sit on top of the hill that's higher than my place on my rivers and stuff and wait for that game to come off of us. Sometimes they wait to shoot them. Other times they shoot down on us at the creek to try to scare them and turn them into them. They harvest the game on public lands, a lot of them. We bring in a lot of hunters. We lead our seasons out with, with uh, uh, wounded warriors. I can give you all the letters, all the, all the stuff you want to see on wounded warriors. The first people that come in on us are missing limbs and legs and stuff like that. We set them up because it's easy, an easy hunt. And that's why a lot of the hunters and outfitters are pissed because they ain't getting it. I bring those wounded warriors in there. They do the first hunts. Right along with them is Make-A-Wish Foundation. We bring those kids in there. I like to see that. I like to hunt with those people. We, we don't, they're just there. And we're, we get known for that and we get calls, a lot of calls. Those uh, Make-A-Wish kids and stuff are coming from all over the United States. The answer is not to kill the game herd out. It's re reduction and it's taking place. But we'll handle some the feed and stuff in some of our bottoms, specific areas, still be able to do the Wounded Warriors, uh, uh, Make-A-Wish Foundations and people like that. We need to fence the cornfields up. It's just that simple. And uh, the, the problem is, is years ago, Fish and Game was having a bunch of uh, baled hay damage and stuff like that. They brought it up and we put the stack yards in. And we put them in for they, where they stay. When we put them stack yards in, we put them too high, put the posts in, and it did everything right. They're still standing, they still protect the hay. I see a lot of them stack yards put in that aren't put that way. What we do is right. but. We can't get the help now. We can't get the help barely to run our operation. So, so if the hunters in here, I give a suggestion of what I think needs to happen with this hunt. The game and fish and outfitters are the only people I know that make money off of livestock, but don't feed them. Expect somebody else to feed them for them, either the taxpayer or the landowner. It's time to rethink that whole thing. And these heavy areas like this, it's got a lot of uh, uh, animals in them that's on private land. The private people will work with you, but you need to block that out in 10 by 10 mile areas. If the outfitters wanna make more money off of, off of them games coming off of them lands, let them pay more or pay part of their expenses. We ain't selling a game. We charge people and later for some, there's big bowls and stuff out in there. <laughs> that will never come close to the losses we're taking. But if we, if we go ahead and fence uh, the corn and stuff, we go ahead and put some uh, incentives in the bottom, bottoms and everything, uh, we'll be able to feed a lot of game and now they're going to move out i suggest that you give people private landowners and i did this last time they need permits and those permits need to be calculated with an accordance of the percentage of the animals that they're dealing with and those permits don't need to be right during season all the time either they need to be provided so that when they're coming in there on the 10th or 12th, we're trying to scare them out of there with drones. We'll bring a few hunters in there and shoot some out of there, spook them out for a while. Maybe at, at, 
maybe we'll watch it with the drones. They'll hear the drones and maybe we'll get some type of handle on it. But part of the problem is when they start hunting the outer areas, when season and stuff is on, they're driving them into the good feed again. So we need permits. The true people that are taking the law so that the private landowners based off of percentage needs permits that they can lead those permits out over the period that the damage has taken place. It does twofold. It helps relieve the pressure off of the crops and it pushes the game back out into the public lands and stuff where these guys are all hunting. If you get up in the morning during hunting season on the first few days on my place on Highway 34, you'd think it's this parking lot right out here. So what, what we're asking for is first of all, I want my money back. I want, I want paid for what for the losses I took. Any information you need, any fertilizer information you need, any spraying information you need. If you want to see the soil tests, it, my experts can be right here standing and talking to you or anytime you want, any one of them. Soil tests, fertilizer, crop specialists, seed companies, they're all listening. The seed companies, we buy specific seeds to mature in certain days so that we can harvest. And why is that? Because of frost and because of the wind in Wyoming. There was no wind damage on this. That's bogus. So saying all that, you know, I've, I've, I've said enough. We'll provide you anything you need to prove the damages and prove where it should have been on those yields. In addition to that, David and them was decent on this. Your state is showing $6 on the corn. We sold our corn at $7.15. And we provided that a bushel. But the problem of it is, one of the other burdens that happens is for us to do all this, we got extra trucking, we got double trucking. We have to weigh every load where we would nor not normally do that to be able to get these reports and stuff in. Usually we'd load, uh, weigh those loads coming out, selling later in the year. This year we was able, we lucked out this year and was able to uh, uh, sell, sell them to, at the time we was harvesting it. Other years, we have to haul them back, store it, and then haul them later. So we got double trucking, double labor, and all that at it to, to be able to get through these reports. And I don't know whether you guys know what my time is, but me putting these programs together with no more knowledge of computers than I have, I'm damned expensive. You know, uh, the, the fact of it is, is from, from putting the programs together all the way down through the whole process costs us money. And we've tried being fair. We've tried staying away from the alfalfa damages. We ate the fencing damages. We have two men from the, from, the, from the time hunting season starts to the end of December. We have two men that does nothing but fix fence. But that's because we don't have the right fences in. The fences will stop. We used electric fences that one year and I paid $2,000 for that hot shocker. And I mean, it's hot. And it helped a lot. It wasn't a little aluminum wire fence. It was about this high double stack that everybody said was going to work. I laughed at that. And the day after that, your people was out there trying to fish that aluminum wire out of my, my fields. It might work on just a few head that walk up there and are curious and they touch their legs and stuff. But when you're talking about animals, and we got deer the same way, when you're talking about animals like that, them little old dinky fences ain't gonna do anything. We put in a, a, a shocker that's a lot hotter. It, it, it's about 70 times hotter than normal and that held them off. But the problem of it is, is I didn't have, it held them off for a period of time until hunting season starts. And then when you push them by hunting, 
they'll go ahead and, and, and force through it. So with, with a combination of the high wire and the extra hot electric fence, I will guarantee you that, that we can control this. And it's gonna to be to everybody's benefit. In addition to that, there's still gonna be that type of hunting out there. You know, we're doing some reduction. The Game and Fish has done some reduction. I let some of your people, not the game wardens, but people that worked in your office call me. They come out and done hunting early. You know, the, 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 the fact is, is we can handle this, some permits we can handle it. It can be handled, it just has to be managed. And that's up to you guys. The buck stops at the top. So I wanna resolve this. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Now, uh, department, present your case, please. Good afternoon. My name is David Ellsworth. I'm game warden supervisor out of the Laramie region stationed in Platte County. I've worked damage claims um, with Mr. Meyer for the majority of my career. Um, and I took over as primary contact for this investigation claim uh, after the uh, former Wheatland game warden Nate Holtz transferred into his current district in Sundance. I've got a couple of goals with this presentation. I apologize in advance. There's a lot of information in some of this. I will, sum, I will summarize um, the portions that I can. Some of it we will have to go through in literally high detail. But the goals out of this, as you heard, um, a, a major dispute in this claim is our investigation process, how we, how we evaluate these fields on the ground, by hand, with field personnel. So I wanna go through exactly what we do there's no argument. I will be the first to tell you, it is arduous. It is time consuming. It's tedious. If we could look at a satellite image, image and come up with uh, an evaluation, trust me, I'd be, the first one in, I'd be the first one in favor. But there's a good reason why we've maintained the same sample process that we have. And I'm gonna go through that in, in some fairly high detail. I also kinda wanna start at the beginning of this claim, um, highlight some of the the pertinent dates that occurred throughout the investigation process. And then finally, I'll go through some of the, uh, the actual calculations from how we took the, the raw data that we calculated out in the field, came up with the overall damage percentages and what that evaluation is worth. So this is a snapshot of the contact log that was included in our investigation report. On our end, it began on May 15th, 2022, when Fred indicated that he wanted to speak to Nate Holst to develop a damage mitigation plan for the upcoming season. He wasn't yet observing damage, but he wanted to, he wanted to start early and begin conversations. So on that date, Warden Holst uh, went to the ranch, provided him and his daughter, uh, Michelle, with the damage claim paperwork and discussed some of the available mitigation options that we have from access programs, uh, lethal removal, hazing techniques, et cetera. Beginning in July uh, is when Fred began sending text messages to uh, our department personnel to document the presence of elk on the property. At that time, it began at approximately 20 elk um, and was reoccurring throughout the month. Warden Holst relocated to Sundance in the middle of July. So on July 19th, I spoke with Fred, indicated that I would be the primary contact for the remainder of this damage claim. I also made a visit out to the property and we discussed several things. I discussed uh, the possibility of applying for and utilizing a chapter 56 lethal take permit by department personnel. At that time, the majority of the elk that were coming into the pivot were bachelor, bachelor groups of bulls. Fred indicated in that conversation that he did not want to focus on bull harvest at that time. He wanted to focus on primary uh, cow harvest, lead cows, lead animals, bringing in big groups of animals 
when that began. He said uh, he indicated for us to hold off on that request at the time, but that he would let us know in another week after monitoring the conditions. I also confirmed that pivot one, which was a pivot that we have sampled for damage in years past, was less fallow, and that would not be included in this year's damage claim as it has in previous years. And then on uh, towards the end of the month, oh, and I also um, I also discussed the possibility of utilizing some drone technology. This was new for us. Uh, we have some newly certified drone pilots in the region and some newly acquired equipment. We wanted to pursue the option of hazing elk through these pivots, through the air, which is some of the uh, some of the footage that that Fred provided to you in his presentation. Fred was in favor of attempting that. So the following week on the 26th, I requested that Warden Strom and Miller, who are our certified drone pilots, come out and meet Fred and his family on their property. They were provided a tour of the property and they were um, shown a couple of ideal places to fly from. So some elevated bluffs, good open landing, um, landing and takeoff zones. Our wardens provided an initial uh, survey flight to A, test the parameters of their equipment, and B, document initial conditions of the pivots as, as we were seeing them. So they were able to document pivots six, seven, and two, three. And I'll show you some maps to clarify these um, later, but pivot two, three is uh, essentially two pivots that are conjoined. It looks like two thirds of a snowman. Um, In the beginning of August, uh, Fred did request for us to apply for that Chapter 56 lethal take permit. A couple of days later, um, Supervisor Withroder and myself were issued that permit, um, and it was allocated for 25 elk. Following week, department personnel made two unsuccessful attempts to lethally remove elk under that permit. And drone hazing efforts continued, continued through the month of August. It should be noted that on August 11th, uh, Warden Miller conducted a, a drone flight and he documented approximately 150 elk on and around pivot 23 and pivot RJ. Those elk were successfully hazed away from those pivots and into Deadhead Creek. So the drone footage you saw of the big groups of elk being pushed away, that was this particular flight on this. David, could I get interrupt you real quick? Would yes, you sir. pull your microphone closer to you? We can't hear you online. Oh, Thank you bet. You. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Yep, be bold. Um, I'll note that this, uh, this hunt area is also in um, area six. We have opening elk seasons that begin August 15th. Um, you'll note that hazing efforts uh, were conducted by department personnel the week of the 16th through the 19th. Um, we were notified that the first round, first batch of hunters that were scheduled to come out to the property became unavailable, weren't able to make it. So we continued some hazing efforts through that first week um, so that we were also um, able to allow Whitetail Ranch to schedule some hunters for the, for the upcoming season. We also, um, we also, with Fred's uh, permission, signed the ranch up into our landowner hunter assistance program to give, um, give Fred and his family the opportunity to be put in touch with hunters, for hunters to reach out, request access, and they could coordinate their own hunting. September 15th, um, I was notified that um, I was notified by Whitetail Ranch that their silage harvest was planned for September 20th. Fred indicated that this would be a portion of pivot 2-3. And being that it was only a portion, I wanted to make sure that we evaluated the correct area. So I made another trip out to the property and went through the area that was to be sampled. And then I coordinated having a significant amount of department staff um, help sample that portion on the 19th. Fast forward a month to October 19th, and I received notification that the remainder of the corn was ready to harvest into grain. So we were able to coordinate 
regional assistance, um, despite being in the middle of hunting seasons at that time in both six and seven, to accomplish our uh, sampling of October 25th. We were notified that harvest was completed on, on November 2nd, which would mark the end of the damage period and the beginning of the 60 day requirement period for them to submit their claim to the department. Okay, there's a lot on this slide, but this is in reference to the affidavit that was submitted uh, by Whitetail Ranch to the department. On that, uh, on that affidavit, um, they claim uh, damage was caused by elk, whitetail deer, mule deer, and antelope. You'll note for the remainder of this presentation and for the purposes of our investigation report, it's pretty easy to distinguish big game damage versus other environmental factors, um, disease plants, et cetera, but it's not feasible to distinguish which type of big game damage is caused. So elk damage versus whitetail damage looks very similar. So for the purposes of our report, damage was attributed primarily to elk, but there's no dispute that there were other animals on the property. A segment on the right is again, a summary of the total losses claimed by Whitetail Ranch. I should note it wasn't provided in this format, so I back calculated what they were claiming in the loss of tons based on the, on the monetary value. So essentially that broke out to 426.86 tons at $70 a ton for um, a silage shortage of $29,880 and a total grain shortage of 39,046.85 bushels, again at a claimed sale price of $7.15 a bushel for a loss of $279, $279,185. The take home message of this portion is that the, the report that was submitted, the affidavit that was submitted utilized their crop agronomist report that used county area averages for their anticipated yield. The, uh, uh, that anticipated yield was then subtracted by their actual harvest for their claim loss. The, um, the county area averages that they mentioned utilizing were not submitted with that affidavit. Um, just as for my own reference, as part of the investigation, I looked at area harvest averages um, throughout the state. And for the, uh, the, claimed, uh, the, the claimed harvest, anticipation of um, silage was about 20 tons per acre. Um, Fred indicated that they lost seven tons per acre due to damage. This damage also um, is solely attributed to elk. So again, no other environmental factors were taken into consideration in this report. The average of 20 tons per acre for silage is pretty on par with what I was able to find for um, previous year's statewide averages of silage. The claimed anticipated yield for grain, however, was significantly higher than what I was able to find for statewide averages. So this is kind of the bread and butter of how we assess corn in the field. Um, the next two slides, again, have a lot of information. This one is particular to grain corn. The next one will be for silage. And the process is pretty similar. So um, we begin by being notified by the department as close to um, within reason prior to harvest. Department personnel will then physically walk through corn rows to assess damage by visually, visually inspecting corn cobs. So with grain corn, <clears throat> corn cobs are what is utilized in the harvest. So that's what we assess for damage. The department uses, as you heard our trophy game guys mention, a more likely than not standard when determining damage. So if there's damage at a particular plant site and there's elk sign in the immediate area, that more likely than not attributed to that plant site being damaged, we account it as being damaged by big game. 
the assessment begins starting at one end of a pivot. Our uh, damage handbook will indicate that you can take five to seven steps. Our policy is to take seven. I wanna make it as consistent as possible. So we'll take seven steps and stop. The idea behind this is to um, make for random sampling and to try to eliminate any personal bias that the observer might have. So at seven steps, you stop. And I apologize for wearing these crusty old boots, but these are the boots that I wore when I evaluated this pivot. So I use the exact same spot right where my eyelets begin as the point on my boot next to the nearest, uh, next to the nearest plant site to sample. So you pick one plant, sample it at that point, at, at that point and evaluate it for damage. Our sample, um, our samples require um, staff to indicate damage in increments of 25%. So if a cob is nibbled off at the top, it's assessed a 25% value. Staff will also document no cob at a plant site, no plant at a, at a particular site. Uh, if there's any raccoon loss, disease or blossom rot, bird loss, and then a site of no damage is assessed to 0%. Once that cob is assessed, step into the next row, whether you're working left or right through the pivot, step one row in, take another step, seven steps, stop and reevaluate. Rinse, repeat, and continue until the entire pivot is, is sampled. Like I said earlier, this, this method is antiquated. It is not sexy technology. It requires a lot of time and a lot of personnel to do it. Um, the reason for this is because we can then evaluate at an individual plant what's going on. Satellite imagery, equipment, um, equipment monitoring systems, they take a big swath, multiple rows at a time and then monitor uh, yield real time. This takes, um, you know, damage occurs one plant at a time. So we monitor and we evaluate one plant at a time. If there's, I should note that if there's no cob, uh, if there's no cob observed, that's bottom line here, if there's no cob observed and there's immediate big game sign in the area, that's assessed 100% damage. More likely than not, damage at that single plant site was attributed to big game. Silage is identical for the first four steps. Again, we take seven steps, stop and evaluate. The difference here in corn silage is that it's, um, the entire plant is utilized in the harvest. So department personnel will evaluate the cob and the remainder of the plant for damage. In these cases, we, uh, we document damage in 10% increments. We also, again, document no cob, no plant, raccoon, disease, bird loss, and no damage. And as I mentioned, we, event, we again evaluate both the cob and the entire plant for damage and assess both for each a percentage of damage. The department has determined um, that 50% of that plant's value comes from the cob, 50% of that plant's value comes from the other portion of the plant. So therefore 50% 50 um, 50 value is attributed to each. So what you'll see just for an example is if an observer sees 60% damage to one cob and 20% damage to the stock and leaves, that individual plant is given a 40% average damage for that plant. Then again, rinse and repeat. Step a row, take another seven steps, take two samples. I wanna just dis briefly discuss uh, some typical common types of damage that we observe in the field. 
uh, broken these into some uh, some categories. So disease, mycotoxins, blossom rot is what I most commonly refer to it as. Blackbird damage um, or bird damage in general, raccoon damage, big game damage, which is what we're here to discuss. That's what we're statutorily obligated to reimburse. And environmental conditions that occur on any pivot. Um, all right. So blossom rot is a broad term for molds that inhibit growth. They're most, uh, uh, most often seen on already damaged, immature, drought-stricken, or stressed plants. And the presence of molds can be seen um, throughout the plant, but it's most commonly seen around the cop site. I will note these photographs and these slides are not of specific photographs of Whitetail Ranch pivots. These are example photographs only. They're just good, clear photographs of this, this type of damage. To relate it back to Whitetail Ranch observations, we did observe several instances of blossom rot in our sampling efforts. Not a lot. Pivot six, we documented 12 samples. Of those 12 samples, nine of those samples were attributed 100% damage valuations due to other big game sign in the area. Again, more likely than not, those, ant those plants were stressed in part due to big game presence in the area. One of those samples was attributed 50% damage and two of those samples were, were attributed 0% damage. Pivot seven is the other pivot where we documented instances of blossom rot. We documented 18 samples in our efforts. All 18 of those samples were attributed 100% damage. Again, more likely than not, big game presence in the area contributed to this type of damage. Bird damage. Again, this is most often attributed by, to blackbird damage. And it's often seen by uh, an existing cob that has kernels missing. This one just coincidentally also has blossom rot. So blossom rot again can be, um, can be present on all sorts of damage. But um, in, this, uh, in this sampling effort, we also documented a couple of instances of bird damage, not a lot. Pivot RJ, we documented two samples of bird damage. And in pivot seven, we documented three samples of bird damage. Raccoon damage, slightly different, often seen with, with uh, characteristic teeth marks, claw marks on the stalks. Uh, you can see shredded cobs, eaten cobs on the ground. Um, oftentimes, uh, cobs will be husked. We also documented some raccoon damage, but again, very minimally. Pivot RJ, two samples. Pivot six, three samples. Big game damage, again, which is what we are statutorily obligated to reimburse and pay on, is defined primarily as direct consumption. So as seen in the photograph here, where a cob is partially bitten, completely bitten, et cetera. We also, uh, we also consider big game damage uh, to stocks. So in this instance, when stocks are broken due to big game animals walking through, and those plant sites are deemed no longer harvestable, so they're broken to the point where they won't be picked up by harvest equipment, those are also assessed 100% damage. So elk are known to like to hang out in corn, they're pretty protected areas, so they will also create day beds. Stomp, scrape, roll around, just like elk do. Cause plenty of damage doing that. In those instances, again, if it cannot be harvested and is deemed, uh, deemed caused by elk, they're assessed 100% damage. So this, um, this segment, essentially, um, so now we've gone through the field. You've, you've seen how we sample those. 
why we sample them so we can evaluate these on an individual plant basis. What do we do with that information after we collect it? Well, I spend a lot of time at the computer compiling all of these raw, muddy data sheets into an Excel file. That way we've got a nice, neat um, profile of each pivot of what those percentages are, how many samples were taken, et cetera. Um, once the harvest is completed by the producer, as Fred noted, we request information as to what that total harvest was. It can be a lot of different, uh, they can submit in a lot of different ways. So it can be um, the way tickets that Fred submitted. It can be the satellite imagery, the live, um, the live tracked harvest data uh, from, their, from their equipment, um, all sorts of things. But we, we require that um, total harvest is provided by the producer to the department. Once we have that total harvest, the corrected yield, or in other words, essentially what the producer could have expected to have harvested had there been no big game damage or no big game presence in the area is also calculated. And you saw, you saw this image uh, earlier on Fred's on Fred's PowerPoint. This is a blown out version of what those tracks look like. Um, and essentially, um, this is what's produced every seven steps move a row. It does look like a zigzag pattern. You zoom in and it's, it's a mess. Um, you'll note, so pivot two, three, have a pointer, there we go. This is pivot two, three. And the, the portion of that pivot in a red outline um, is the portion that we were informed was going to be the, the silage harvest. So you'll see a lot of tracks through here because essentially this was sampled twice. Uh, we sampled it for silage early on. When we came back out several weeks later to, uh, to sample the remainder of the grain corn, we noticed that part, that part of this area had not yet been harvested. So we resampled the standing corn that was still there again for grain damage. Um, and it should also be noted that um, our department personnel are basically required whenever they're performing these, turn on their GPS on their phone and track their movements throughout the day. So wherever they, wherever they walk throughout these pivots, this is what's translated onto their GPS. Just to note, I'd mentioned that I've, um, I've investigated damage claims on this property or assisted with the investigation of damage on these properties for multiple years. This just happened to be a satellite image from 2019. Again, the pivots are the same condition between the two is relatively similar as well. Again, of note, the bottom left-hand corner is pivot one. That's one that we've historically sampled. That was fallow this year, so it was not evaluated. As Fred alluded to, the, um, the overall damage percentages are on the right-hand side. Pivot 2-3 in the grain corn portion is 19.65%. The silage portion was found to be at 21.13%, RJ 7.73, Pivot 6 7.04, Pivot 7 17.27. So this is a culmination of our efforts, the number of samples that were taken at each one. Um, again, 1,400 samples in pivot two, three, the grain corn, over 700 for pivot six, 799 pivot seven, and 763 for pivot RJ. In the grand scheme of things, when you're planting 30 plus thousand plants per acre, he's correct. This is not a lot of samples, but it's randomized, it's representative of the overall condition of a pivot and it samples at an individual scale. So if there's damage, if there's any sign at a specific plant site, this method will pick that up. The overall silage effort was 1200 samples for a damage percentage of 21.31. up here. Okay. Um, 
again, these, um, these figures, these calculations, these were all provided in our damage investigation report that was provided to the landowner. So this first, uh, this first calculation slide, I'm gonna go through line by line. All of the pivot calculations are identical, so we can summarize the, the next slides, but I wanna make sure that this one's really clear. We noted several distinct differences between the affidavit that was submitted by uh, Fred's agronomist um, to the Casper office and the raw data that had the individual waste slips for the total harvest that was submitted directly to me. Two things of note, um, sale price for the grain corn was noted in the raw data at $7.15 as Fred indicated, as well as $7 per bushel. So department personnel took the total weight sold at each price and calculated a projected loss and a, and a recommended reimbursement value at each price. So for each of these, you will see two sets of calculations. So again, given the, um, the assessed damage percentage, there we go. Um, the reported harvest from the producer was 283,620 pounds, which means in the absence of any big game damage, they could, have, they could have expected to harvest 352,980.71 pounds. That translates into a loss by big game or elk by six, of 63,360.71 pounds. Since the sale is by bushel, that translates to 1,238.58 bushels. for a recommended reimbursement of loss of $8,855.85. The portion of this pivot that was sold at $7 a bushel was 489,160 pounds, which means they would have expected to harvest, oh, where'd it go? There it is. They would have expected to harvest 608,786.56 pounds in the absence of big game. Or in other words, a loss created by big game of 119,000 pounds. Translating that into bushels, at again, $7 per bushel, is a recommended reimbursement of $14,953.33. Add those together for a total recommended reimbursement of this pivot of $23,809.18. This is in comparison to the gold box at the top of Fred's claimed loss of $100,655. There we go. All right, pivot six was calculated the exact same way. Again, there was sale of um, sale of this pivot at both seven fifteen and seven dollars. So the recommended um, the recommended payment based on loss uh, created by elk at seven dollars and fifteen cents is four thousand three hundred and twenty four dollars and eighty nine cents. The portion sold at seven dollars translated into a loss of big game of 11,000 um, 11, and change pounds for a recommended reimbursement of $1,375.08 for a grand total recommended reimbursement of this pivot, $5,699.97. This is in comparison to Fred's claimed amount of $63,283.
Pivot seven was done the exact same way. Again, two sale prices, recommended reimbursement for the sale of uh, the portion of the pivot sold at seven fifteen, three thousand eight hundred and twenty four dollars and eighteen cents. And the portion of this pivot that was sold at seven dollars bushel has a recommended reimbursement with eight thousand nine hundred and sixty four dollars and thirty four cents for a grand total of twelve thousand seven hundred and eighty eight dollars and fifty two cents. Again, in comparison to the to the claim loss. Pivot RJ, again, the same, sold at two separate prices. Recommended reimbursement for the portion of the pivot sold at $7.15, is $2,805.66. Recommended payment for the portion of the pivot sold at $7 is $4,749.64. Total recommended reimbursement of this pivot, $7,555.30 in comparison to the claimed amount above. Must be late in the day. I think my clicker's getting tired. Okay. Uh, this one's just slightly different because it's for the silage calculations. $70 per ton. Um, there was no dispute on the price of this. So uh, the percent damage deemed um, found in our investigation is 21.13%. And that's just, again, an average of the two types of damage that were documented. So um, since silage utilizes both the cob and the plant, cob was assessed 23.2%, plant was assessed 19.05% for an average of 21.13. Reported harvest was 772.92 tons, which means in the absence of big game, they could have anticipated to harvest seven, nine, excuse me, 979.99 tons which means a loss of 207.07 .07 tons for a recommended reimbursement of $14,494.90. This again is in comparison to the claimed amount above. So we, uh, I, I wanted to put these in because we, uh, we are utilizing some satellite imagery, not to the point where, rely, where we're relying on it at an individual plant scale to determine damages, but to monitor the overall health and condition of pivots that we're, that we're keeping track of. This image um, was dated July 25th. And this is around the time period, that July 25th period is around the time period where we began our elk casing efforts with drones. This image was again dated for August 4th. And then again for September 18th, towards the end of towards the end of the growing season. I should note, I um, and Fred mentioned that I did request the the thermal satellite images, the heat maps that he showed you, um, and I received, I believe, two of those. Um, in discussions with Fred, however, he had informed us that those maps were not reliable. They um, he mentioned in his presentation, but they were having technical difficulties with the software. They weren't accurate, and therefore they weren't considered um, as a reliable source of harvest, which again is why we, we use the individual waste slips that they provided um, in their Excel file. So in summary, Adding up all of the individual pivots, the department recommends partial payment to the total of $49,852.97 for grain corn, $14,494.90 for silage, for a total reimbursement of $64,347.87. Just to compare things side by side, Whitetail's claimed valuation of green corn is on the left. The department's 
um, determined valuation on the right and the difference between the two is on the far right. Total difference again, $244,717.13. To cover the portion of Chapter 28 regulations that requires landowners to provide a sufficient access for hunting on their property, I wanted to put up the general license structure. I know we've had lots of discussions over the recent months of Area 6 elk, elk in general, but just to, um, just to re-clarify, hunting seasons are open in this area from August 15th to the end of January. Area six being that it's primarily a private land area is uh, more or less landowner control. So the department has taken the position of maximizing the amount of opportunity available to the public, which means that we typically have leftover licenses at the end of each year. At the end of this last year, we had 207 type six licenses that remained unsold at the end of the season. As far as um, meeting hunter, hunter pressure to meet recruitment, you'll note that chapter 28 regulations were recently amended with language clarification in January for the purposes of this damage claim, the previous year's uh, regulation has to be considered. So the new language would not apply in this situation. Whitetail Ranch as they, oops, excuse me, Whitetail Ranch as they reported allowed 34 hunters on their affidavit for the 22-23 season. And Whitetail Ranch reported charging between zero and $2,500 a hunter for access. No landowner coupons or hunter lists were provided um, for the 22 hunting season. Um, and from their damage affidavit, Whitetail Ranch reported up to 200 elk present on the property throughout the damage period. Just of note, the most recent biological reports that we have um, indicates a recruitment of 33 yearlings per 100 cows for the uh, between the 2016 to 2022 time period. So in summary, the department doesn't dispute that there's significant damage. The, de the department doesn't dispute that there's been significant damage for so several years. The damage noted in this investigation report is consistent with the damage that's been noted in previous investigations. The department recognizes that our conventional hazing and lethal removal techniques have limited effectiveness. We rely heavily on hunter participation. We rely heavily on, on unconventional methods. The department sampling method and calculations are consistent with statewide sampling techniques that determine big game damage from other wildlife damage and environmental factors. Again, it's antiquated, it's tedious, it's a pain, but it works on an individual plant basis and it eliminates bias and it removes environmental factors. And then our elk hunting season structure in this place again, are in place to maximize opportunity for harvest. And with all of that, I would stand for any questions. Thanks, David. Um, I need to consult my director. Okay, just a second, Fred. Okay, so I've been told we're supposed to be out of this room by six o'clock. So if we don't get this issue resolved, I will resume it tomorrow, tomorrow morning, first thing. That's the best I can do because I want this case due time for my commissioners. So with that in mind, let's keep chugging along, doing what we can. Mr. Myers, you can rebut for a minute, okay. a couple of minutes. I 
didn't tell you that the metabolite was enhancing progress. What I did tell you was that some of the other types, no satellite images of the metabolite. I have satellite images that are incorrect, but they weren't, uh, they were not provided for this hearing. The ones that are on there aren't correct. Uh, uh, that's hey, number one. Fred, would you address the commission and yeah, and use the microphone? Well, I, 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 Dave does good work, but uh, those satellite images that are on there are correct. The Your ones that he's talking images. about that I told him was not good images. That's why I didn't provide them. I'd like to have good images for the others too. Uh, the other thing is when they said they removed successfully those elk to Deadhead Creek. Deadhead Creek is one quarter of a mile out of those fields. Run your cow herd out there a quarter of a mile and come back an hour later, see what happens. The same as with elk or deer. You know, uh, the plants that they're counting are going through, and I watch them, they're going through doing the steps like he's talking about and stuff and picking ears. But what happens when that plant is damaged? Like I showed you those green plants and stuff. Instead of that plant making making 14 or 16 rows around and 34 to 38 kernels tall, it shrinks down to where it might only produce 10, 10 uh, kernels or so. So when they look at that kernel, if it isn't bitten off, evidently it's not damaged. The plant was damaged in July. It didn't perform. That's the whole thing. That's why I showed you the green plants and, and the damages and stuff down there. Those paths down through there on one side, I don't know whether there's two, a couple of guys going down through there, they go down and come back. And there were so many feet, and it ain't even down the row. A lot of them are crossroads when, when you look at how that's planted. And you look at the pictures of how they're planted. And they measure and they reach down. What about the plants that don't have any? They're just a plant. Most of that stuff is done because it's been damaged early or the tassels have been pulled out and the ears don't develop. You know, it, the, the, the mold that he's talking about, and he, he said it, where them blow up blossoms and stuff are eaten and where those plants are damaged, it creates, a, it creates disease in, in those, you know. When you look at the bushel yields and stuff, and you go back to them first blue pages in the reports, I told you we fertilized for 200 to 220 bushel on the acre. We did everything else for that. Those circles have produced that. And when you look at the real green spots in there via satellite uh, photos, or the yield monitors, those are bumping up there against it. So the, cap the, the capability was there. The food was there, the water was there, everything was there. They were damaged. And that damage brought it down a lot more than 19% or 7%. Because all you got to do is look at the yield monitors. It is an antiquated system, but it's no good. It never has been any good. It's one you can accept and pay a hell of a lot less money for. But it ain't fair. And your people damn sure don't need to be going through that. You ain't flying them with the eagles to trace them. Or having them hold on to a bear's tail to figure out where he went. You're using satellites. That's the same thing. That, that planner that goes down through there, we adjust that. If we want 34,000 plants per acre, in one part of the field, and we want to adjust it down off the satellite, it'll adjust that planter or to adjust the amount of the fertilizer. It's here. We're in 2023, 2022. That stuff's here. It's proven. It works. So then where we have the big problem right here is the utilization of that old antiquated system and not getting out of that mold. I don't know what type of educational process these people are going through to analyze plants, value how many bushels per acre, 
when they pull an air off, when you pull an air off, you can count the kernels on that air, step it off 17, strip all 17 of those, and it'll tell you how many bushel an acre you're gonna make when you figured out those uh, formulas. Reliable, been reliable for years. When you've stripped that plant, are you looking for it to be eaten off and say, oh, hell, there's a quarter of that eaten off, therefore 75% of it's good, but it's only a four inch year? What, what type of agronomy, what type of plant science is going into those calculations? What I'm offering is plant science, plant calculations, professionals that feed the plant, professionals that watch the plant, professionals that look at the total damage and satellite images that show the damages. Those pictures that I'm showing you down through there, you can look across them then uh, fields and see it all the way through. And you can see the game trails where they go in and split off. You can physically see all that stuff. When you're walking across there and you walk across that game trail and your step don't come out the other way, where are you at? You know, it doesn't work. And truthfully, it never has. Everybody accepted it because it was some type of mediation to get something done. But in today's world, it don't work. And you wasn't paying five and a half dollars a gallon for diesel fuel. You wasn't paying the fertilizer cost. You wasn't paying $300 a bag for seed at that point in time. You are today. Well, Mr. Meyer, without a doubt, you have damage. We don't, we don't deny that at all. Today, we're not gonna be able to change our methodology. But I do think you make a very good point that our methodology needs revisited. And I don't know the legal process for the department to change that, but uh, I think we should look into that. So are you ready for questions from the commission? Yeah, I am. If, I got one other question. If, if, if I took any one of you guys, any one of you, are you capable of eating $300,000 and throwing them in the waste paper basket out of your money? Do you want to do that? Can you do that? Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm ready for questions. Commission, I open it up to the commission now. Do we have questions? Well, come on up, Craig. You can ask a question. President Broca, members of the commission, I just wanted to offer a, a little bit further insight. Uh, Mr. Myers has really touched on the on the uh, satellite imagery and the use of that technology. Uh, Supervisor Ellsworth touched on that momentarily, um, but I do think it's important to know that we we have that capability. We we have purchased service to try to utilize it and determine how it could help us better better identify damage. What it does for us is it allows us to monitor soil moisture, water uh, applications, all of those things. And you can you can even watch over time when the harvest happens, the field dries out, when the water comes on, you see the moisture come up. You can see where there's leaks and pivots, um, where there's environmental conditions, uh, just naturally where there's draws that, that hold water and run water. All of that's very valuable, but what it doesn't allow us to do is pinpoint what causes the damage. When you look at the, the red spots on there, we can't say that that happened by elk or deer or whether it was a spaceship. And that's where that falls short for us when we evaluate the amount of damage. But I agree with Mr. Meyer very much. There's some certain applicabilities there, but we've had a hard time being able to apply that practically in what we're doing to determine species by species damage. Greg, you can take your satellite images. And when you look at the pictures of them damages, it tells you it's a certain wheel track on that sprinkler. Well, I, those I don't, I don't argue and they've been, they've been inspected. It tells you that it's elk damage on that them specific damages. Mr. Meyer, let's get. Let's get. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so they're, they're pointed out and, and, and they're numbered out. That's why we numbered them and everything, because that same point come up a couple of years ago. And if you analyze that over the years, now that the images that they're showing in the satellite is an all right image, but the fact of it is, those images, you can go back and you can pull those images through the season. Infrared, use them, and it'll show the damages as it progresses. Not just the, 
the water spots that he's talking about, stuff like that. You can see the damage progress in. Uh, and and uh, my son, I, he can give you the program where you can watch that. You can watch it happen. Okay, let's uh, let's go. Uh, questions to the commission um, on the damage claim today. I want I want to do two things, and we're down to minutes, so we, we're probably looking at a table decision until tomorrow. I want to address this damage claim, and then I want some honest discussion and direction on how to fix this problem because you don't want to come back. We don't want you back. We don't want to go back. Um, and just these landowner reoccurring problems, I really think we need to work together with our local staff and the landowner and find some real solutions. So I'm going to challenge both of you to, to bring some ideas to that discussion. But first, let's finish the damage claim on board commissioners. Uh, Mr. President, um, I'll go first, um, if that's acceptable. Please do so. Uh, Mr. Meyer, my name is John Masterson, and I'm one of the commissioners. I, I want you to know I hear everything you're saying, and um, I hear how frustrated you are, and um, I want you to know that hearing this and the issues that um, this method presents um, is frustrating for us as well. Um, so obviously we're, we're not in your shoes. I'm not trying to say we are, but we recognize that there's damage caused by wildlife. We recognize that. And um, you've, uh, it sounds like you've done everything you were supposed to do. Um, so I don't know if what we can do to at this moment because we have this system, right? In the regulations, in the handbook of what we're supposed to do. We'll talk more about that. Here's my question, or a couple questions. Um, uh, Supervisor Ellsworth came out with some people and they walked your field, right? Right. Okay. Um, did you have, did you, or have you ever seen that handbook on the method that they're supposed to use? Yes, okay. David and them presented them. To, let me let me tell you this: I'm not in an argument with the people on the ground. I like David and them. They don't have the right tools. All right, and they're trying to defend the tools they got for you guys, and it's wrong. Okay, and I I hear what you're saying. I need you to know that I really do. Um, my question was whether or not you feel they used that method that they're supposed to. Whether it's right or not, do you think they applied it correctly? I don't know. Okay. I, I, for, I, I say that like this. I, I went there when they pulled in there. I got a, I trust David as far as stuff like that. You know, he, he was instructing that thing. And I'm not going to say he's going to cheat on any of that because I don't believe he'd do it. Sure. But the method don't work. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, so the question really, it's this isn't a conflict with Supervisor no. Ellsworth. Um, it's this methodology. Is that fair? Well, I'm trying to stand up for him because he's in the middle of this thing. Yeah, he is. Um, and if I, somewhere in all of these materials, I think I read that um, you and the department agreed on the price of silage and on corn? The price that we gave you on corn because we had to sell it right away. Right. Those are actual numbers. Those, that chart that's in there that, that uh, uh, gives you our dollar loss, uh -huh. those are truckloads that were weighed and sold the day they were weighed. Okay. That, those prices are actual prices. Okay. My question, I didn't ask it very well. Um, did the department and you agree on those prices? Is there, a, are, is there a dispute about what the price of corn was and what the price of silage? I don't think so. I think I looked okay. in there uh, and, and we're talking about the same price. They're the same. Okay. That's all I have right now. Ms. Breyer, appreciate everything you brought. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Roberts. Sorry, excuse me. That I 
the average grain corn yields were determined by years of field records and, and the county averages. And so could you kind of lead me through that? And then, and then with the department, I want to know kind of what their interpretation of consequential damages are to start. Well, uh, our, we pay a guy to come out there, a crop specialist or a couple of them. And uh, they ha we have for years since a bunch of this started. And so they're able to look back at our old yields, our old combine yields, but they also took the county average. And if you look on them blueprints, he's saying he's going by the county average. His calculations are off the county average. The, 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 the big difference is, is in the percentages of damages and the way they were collected. The, he's using the same starting point these guys are at the county average. The fact is that county average isn't right because you can have a county average and what this guy over here is putting on 100 pounds of nitrogen without any phosphorus and his yield is going to be a hell of a lot lower than yours. We soil test it. We will provide you soil tests every so many feet out there what it needed to hit 200 to 220 bushel an acre. Every one of those fields got points all over them where they sampled the soil. They will tell you, and we can provide you, where it was fertilized for that 200, 220 bushel an acre. In addition to that, that crop scientist kept track of the watering and everything like that. Every five days, that got the required uh, rain off of those sprinkler systems. They're all under sprinklers. So it's not a moisture factor. It's not a food factor. It's none of that. It was damage. It's damage I, I hate to see because it didn't need to be. And I hate to sit here and just blame the elk and stuff for it. Because it's our problems. We keep cattle out of there. We keep horses out of there. Don't tell me we ain't smart enough to keep the elk out of there. It is. It's a fact of spending the money. Or Commissioner Roberts? Yeah. Um, so I'd like the department to answer, answer the consequential damage. Is, is, does that fall into what he's talking about? Is that why some of the. Uh, well, just go ahead and give me a definition of consequential damage. Sure, President Brokaw, Commissioner Roberts. So in the in the Chapter 28 Commission regulations, uh, consequential damages, uh, I, I believe the part you're interested in is the second half of, of the of the uh, paragraph, though, but consequential damage includes, but is not limited to future or anticipated production. So when that's mentioned, I can't I can't take anything away from what Mr. Meyer did to to reach a certain level of harvest a yield that's what he anticipated I, I would do the same thing if i was selling a truck i would have an anticipated value that i would want to get out of it for us we had our only way to do it and this speaks to the method that um, is at stake here or, or is being called into question we need to know what was actually harvested from the field in order to back calculate the percentage but to to consider that I did everything right and I, I anticipated getting 220 bushels or 200 or whatever that number is, it's really irrelevant. If I get anything less than that, then all of that is attributed towards elk damage. And that's what you're saying. No, what difference is, what he's saying here, some, he's saying there's a, a hypothesis that I can't prove here and that's wrong. Pull up the yield maps and go to the dark green where the damage isn't and those yields are proven right there in the same field. They're there. The yields are there where the damage is not. It's not strictly a hypothesis. However, you can do that. I spent, I spend a lot of money, a quarter to a half a million dollars a year on those hypotheses because they're reliable. But that's not what this is. This is actual damages. If those guys would have picked, and you can pick it up and look, do an overlay of their steps down through there and see if they went down through the dark green spot. 
and look at the analysis of that dark green spot, you're going to see 180 to 200 bushel an acre. You remember the dark green spot down through there, the strips? That's where they weren't damaged. Now, why? I have no idea. Because you look all the way around, I'd like to know that answer. All right. But when you go down through those dark green spots, those plants weren't damaged by the elk and they worked all the way around it. If there's some magically formula or something out there, I'd have been using it. But it's proven. And those yields are proven. The fact of it is, is you're working off of something that's been tremendously damaged already and trying to do your analysis. You're taking somebody, wanting them to run their 100 yards that used to run it in a short period of time, cutting their legs off and telling them to try to run it. That's what you're doing when you, you're doing your analysis on those fields. It's proven. But that's what you're basing your, excuse me. No, go ahead. But that's what you're basing your actual damages off of. Which? Which is the yield, what the uh, county yield, uh, average grain corn yields by year of the field records and county averages. That's what you're basing off. Uh, you have to forgive me, I'm probably a little slow on this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Tell me, and, and, uh, David and them can tell me, they're going out there looking at something damaged, analyzing the yield. What hypothesis are they basing that analysis off of? They're looking at damaged stuff. So what we're saying is this, we have a history, the county has a history, we have yield maps that show actually where it's not damaged and it is making what was projected in those same fields. We have proof. In addition to that, we have all this other proof. It's not, it, the, the whole thing's not a hypothesis and you can bring any of your top agronomists in and ask them if you do this and provide it all the water, barring any damage, whether it's predictable. And falling back on that, law or reg or whatever he's reading there, okay, is BS. Because when you look at them yield monitor maps, and we had people in the field when it was green and followed it every few weeks watching the damage, we provided you everything except two satellite images that I screwed up, but you can look at the pictures and see it's the same. And we'll give you everything more. Now we, we, we're an open book to this thing. You're welcome to all of our records, all of our fertilizer records, all of our water. We can tell you exactly how much water is on everything, all of it. It's not a hypothesis and it's not a guess. All right, crew, we're 10 minutes over. We got to clear the room. We need to finish up questions for Mr. Meyer. We'll table this discussion till tomorrow. We'll let um, Warden David have another speak he wants to speak again um i know it's a severe inconvenience for you not to get a, a decision today um it's been recommended to me that we start at 7 30 tomorrow i'll um, be here you can be here we can set you up via zoom um we'll try and accommodate do you, you want any further information from me would the commission like any other data commissioner bell yeah mr president thank you this probably does, maybe doesn't even have any Thing to do with the methodology methodology or anything but um fred how why don't you um turn in any landowner coupons i'm just curious pisses me off hey fair enough you're giving me 15 dollars for an elk that's cost me whatever i got them dave knows i don't turn them in a lot of time i got i don't know how many we got we got i hell i have uh i probably have 20 from disabled veterans because i i let them take the easy stuff and I set up the blinds so they could get them. They can't even, some of them guys can't even get out of the pickup. I got them. Just, I was just yeah. curious. I didn't think you'd sugarcoat it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. David, what do you have for us? I apologize. I had, uh, I had one more discrepancy noted that I feel like is pretty important that I need to bring up. Um, 
we discovered uh, between the, the waste slip, the actual harvest that we utilized for each pivot, um, in comparison to the report that Mr. Andreas supplied for the, for the claim affidavit, there's a difference on pivot seven of 30,100 pounds. So there was less harvest reported in the affidavit than was actually determined on the waste slips of 30,100 pounds. So when we determined our calculations for pivot seven, we used the total weights, the total weights including those additional 30,000 pounds. So you're, you're saying you went, your damage calculation was off waste slips actually? Correct. Okay. You're saying 30,000 in the in the waste slips. That's correct. Yeah, our damage was basically figured on the waste slips. So that's when Doug gave you the return. Sure. So what I'm saying is the is the addition of pivot seven yeah. on on Brian's report was thirty thousand pounds, thirty thousand one hundred pounds less than the total weight that was provided in the weights. Oh. That what what we did the because when you if you'll remember how it was wet and stuff during harvest, we tried adjusting them up variously uh, because. You never end up with a full truck load all the time at the end of the field or something. And because of the wet wet ground and stuff, we just have to pop back and forth to try to find somewhere. So it could show one pivot off a little more than the other. That's all I have. Thanks, David. Thank okay, you. commissioners, I need a motion to table. So move. Second. Move second. Uh, this is agenda item is tabled till 7.30 tomorrow morning. Oh, sorry. All those in favor of the idea, say aye. aye. Opposed, say the sign. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Thank you, David. Sorry we didn't get through it. So,